everyone seated? Thank you. Now would you all please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any new members? Skip it. So let's skip it. Okay. You want to close the Oh. Does that help? Okay. Yeah. Oh, so We're making executive decisions up here. Don't, don't worry about it. Do we call the roll? Do not call the roll. You got to find a <laughs> list so we can call the roll. Y'all set? Yep. All right. Miss Garcia, would you call the roll, please? Eva Henry? Jeff Baker? Here. Elise Jones? Here. David Beacom? Here. Randy Wheelock? Sean Wood? Nicholas Williams? Here. Kevin Flynn? Jolan Clark? Here. Roger Partridge? Here. Ron Engels? Libby Zabo? Tina Francone? Here. Bob Pfeiffer? Here. Bob Roth? Here. Larry Vidham? Here. David Spellman? Aaron Brockett? Here. Margo Ramsden? Here. Lynn Baca? Matt Johnston? Roger Hudson? Here. George Teal? Yes. Tammy Mauer? Present. Catherine Hyder? Laura Christman? Earl Holland? Richard Champion? Gail Christie? Rick Teeter? Here. Debbie Nasta? Catherine Whitman? Steve Conklin? Here. Linda Olson? Cheryl Wink? Jeff Deacon? Daniel Dick? Drew Peterson, Bobby Sindelar, Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Lynette Kelsey, Here. Scott Norquist, Storm Glore, Jim Dale, Here. Ron Rakowski, George Here. Lamb, Here. Mike Hillman, Stephanie Walton, Christine Berg, Dana Gutwein, Jerry Bean, Isaac Levy, Karina Elrod, Kyle Schlachter, Jacob Lofgren, Larry Strzok, Wynn Shaw, Joan Peck, Marsha Martin, Ashley Stolzman, Here. Connie Sullivan, Barney Drystat, Joyce Palazuski, Paul Sutton, Sean Forey, Chris Larson, Jordan Sowers, Julie Mollica, John Dyack, Here. Sally Daigle, Roberta Mooney, Mark Lasis, Jessica Sandgren, Herb Atchison, Here. Bud Starker, Here. Deborah Perkins Smith, Adam Zarin, Bill Van Meter. Here. Okay, good. All right, next item up is a request to move to approve the agenda for tonight. So moved. We have a motion, we have a second. Right. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion is carried. First item up is a report of the Transportation Committee. The RTC met uh, yesterday. And we will be going through all the meetings from the agenda uh, later on in that, so I'll save the time for when we get to there. Next item up is the chair of the P&E committee, Mr. Dyack. Thank you, Chair. Um, we met on uh, Wednesday, November 14th, and uh, we talked about the conflict of interest policy, which has been moved forward to this agenda. We also elected our representative for the nominating committee. It is Director Rakowski, who is not here, but uh, hopefully here in spirit. And uh, that is all. Okay. Ms. Dolsman, F and B. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the Finance and Budget Committee met. We have nominated Elise Jones to serve as our member for the nominating committee. We thank her very much for that. 
Um, we also allocated some pass-through funding for senior services to some very um, worthy individuals and just some of those in it, it's inclusive of many more than just this list, but including Douglas County, Arapahoe County, City and County of Denver, Adams County, and Broomfield were all awarded funding. So we were excited to do that. We also have um, authorized the executive director to negotiate contracts for some more planimetric data, which is really important to us. And there's some really great news that there is a negotiation uh, underway to try to execute a contract to sublease our old space. So more to come on that. Okay, thank you very much. Now, this is a hard part, because this, is, this has been somebody who's been engaged with Dr. Cog for four decades plus, and did she go running out of the room again? No, she's in, she's in the back. Chuck, where's she at? Roxy, come on up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So if you, if you haven't had the opportunity, if you're new here, let me introduce Roxy Ronson. This is our, has been our heart and soul here, and all the, every employee who works for Dr. Cog has been hired by Roxy, wow. <laughs> except maybe one. There was one person that's been here longer than she has. Wow. But Roxy has just uh, wrapped up 42 years with Dr. Cog. Now, for me, it's extra special because she also lives in Westminster. <laughs> <laughs> and I also know one of her favorite restaurant hangouts because we both go there. <laughs> but uh, on behalf of the Dr. Cog board, we have a couple little things here oh for recognition. Gosh, thank you. She's not going to have to sing. <laughs> I've already been threatened with that yeah. one. Uh -huh. <laughs> but uh, the Denver Council of Governments, the State of Colorado Board of Directors, Resolution Number 132018. A resolution commanding Roxy Ronson for her distinguished and dedicated service to the Denver Regional Council of Governments. Whereas Roxy Ronson has been a valued and respected staff member of the Denver Regional Council of Governments since May 11, 1976. For those of you who were not born by then, don't oh, say anything. <laughs> and I was just born when I started. And she started at four, right? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Whereas over the past 42 years, Roxy Ronson has exhibited an exceptional level of performance and effort in many key roles at Dr. Cog. And whereas Roxy Ronson possesses a reputation for her own thoroughness, enthusiasm, and exceptional negotiating acumen, as defined by Doug Ross. I'm going to get there. I got it. I'm going to hold it for no, you. No, I know. Sorry. <laughs> I can, I'm a dexterous. I can work with both hands. <laughs> <laughs> and has leveraged it for the benefit of Dr. Cox's financial and business operations. And whereas over her career, Roxy Ronson has worked for four executive directors and was intimately involved in three office relocations. If anybody needs a house relocated or packed, call Roxy. <laughs> now, therefore, be it resolved that the Denver Regional Council of Governments heartily expresses its gratitude and appreciation to Roxy Ronson for her dedicated and distinguished service to the Dr. Cog Board of Directors and staff. Be it further resolved that the Dr. Cog Board of Directors and staff extend to Roxy Ronson their best wishes on her retirement and for her future endeavors. She is now free to engage in other activities on the third Wednesday evening of every month and on every day henceforth. <laughs> she has earned it. Resolved and passed and adopted the 28th day of November 2018 at Denver, Colorado, Herb Atchison Chaired Board of the Directors of the Denver Regional Council of Governments. Roxy Ronson, ladies and gentlemen. So the other piece, if you remember, to make Bob Roth jealous, <laughs> if, if for no other reason, we have this beautiful Long's Peak statue with Roxy's uh, name and stuff and embossed here for her 42 years of service. And uh, you have to get more than one clock to even get a corner of it, Bob. So you've got to stay another 10 years to get another clock. But we do have some clocks left over that we plan to hold for Bob on his 10th anniversary. <laughs> so Roxy, on behalf of the Board of Directors and the staff as well, we want to present you one of the very first 
of the Dr. Cog Staff Employee Recognition Award. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you all. <laughs> I could tell you a lot of stories, but that would make me even longer, and I don't want to do that. So thanks again. It's been a great journey, and I appreciate your well wishes. <laughs> You should have seen her at the Employee Award one. <laughs> we could, all we could do was keep her here. <laughs> so at this point, Mr. Rex, have you got anything you'd like to add? I, well, mic test, mic test. Oh, thank you. It helps to turn it on. <laughs> Gee whiz. No, thank you very much. So this is my executive director report, I assume? If you can get that far. I will. Okay. No, uh, thank you very much. I would be remiss if I didn't at least um, just offer my debt of gratitude for the work that um, Roxy has done over these years. I mean, we talk about, you know, May 11th, 1976, that was actually the day my brother was born. Oh. And so I'll never forget the day you started, Roxy, but, but she's been, I mean, she's been unbelievable. I've been here five years now, and I know I'm going to miss her dearly, and we're going to keep, keep her around a little bit, try to retain her agreement. Hopefully she agrees to it. But uh, she's, she's um, I, I can't even tell you. I mean, she's always been, you know, it's those staff folks that are kind of in the shadow. She doesn't like to be out front and taking platitudes for whatever. But, I mean, I'm telling you, with the work that she does, and if you, I'm, t I'm, I'm actually serious about this. If you want benefits, someone to, to negotiate your benefits, that's the lady right there. She's unbelievable. So thank you, Roxy, for, for all your time. And we're, we're really going to miss you. Mm. All right, December. Um, so uh, just some meeting changes that are not reflected in your packet. We are going to cancel the uh, December uh, work session and performance and engagement committee meetings. Um, you're welcome. But don't get too don't get too comfortable though. Um, you know, I, I you know to be honest with you guys, I think we've we've been sensitive to the fact that um, you know there's a lot going on right now with the sub regional meetings and all that, and and uh, to ask you to come downtown for another meeting unless it's absolutely necessary. I think we're we're trying to avoid that. I will say that the performance and engagement committee right now is looking at the uh, the work session and how we've conducted those in the past and looking at ways to make that my more robust experience for you all so stay tuned over the next month or so we um, um, hopefully the P&E will be able to report out um, to you all um, you did get some uh, some some handouts at your table uh, first I want to just mention the uh, um, the 2019 award celebration. Thrive is our theme this year as we celebrate the people, projects, and places that are that are moving us towards Metro Vision outcomes. So save the date. It's Wednesday, April 10th, and it's at the Hyatt Regency where we did it last year. Um, so tonight, really, what we want you to, to be aware of is that the nominations for the various awards uh, are open. So please um, uh, give some thought to uh, projects within your communities or projects that you're aware of is, that um, you think would be uh, worthy for, uh, for, for one of the, the uh, Dr. Cog Awards. Um, you know, we got tremendous response to the posters that you guys all did for our annual workshop up in, um, up in Keystone this year. Um, so, you know, some of those projects, for example, are very, very strong candidates for, for this award. So please consider that. And last but not least is the John V. Christian Award. That's our, that's, you know, kind of the big one for us. And last year we, um, last year winner was Mr. Louisville, Chuck Sisk, won that award. So please give some consideration of those you think have, um, you know, has gone above and beyond as far as, um, you know, regionalism in this area. And uh, we'd be uh, delighted if you would submit their name for consideration. Winter Bike to Work Day, a uh, little mini poster here, here for, for you all. Uh, please save the date on that. It's February 8th, 2019. Dr. Cog's staff, um, in uh, partnership with the state, kind of does the, um, um, you know, the marketing and, and work associated, the background work associated with this, with this event. We have 3,000 cyclists that competed, that, that registered last year. We're shooting for 4,000 this year. So hopefully uh, we'll, be, we'll, be, we'll be able to get that. Um, the last item I will mention that was in, in front of you guys was um, had to do with the Area Agency on Aging. Um, we're seeking proposals for the next grant cycle for the Older Americans Act, Title III, and state funding for senior services. Um, projects um, 
uh, would begin at July 1 of 2019. Um, so please help us get the word out about this, where we are looking all the time for, for new vendors and um, new partners um, to help us in the area of aging, uh, aging services, of course. Um, there's two important mandatory training. There's a December 12th in-person one and a webinar on a December uh, 14th. And submittals are due January 11th. Stamp UC. Uh, urban, urban Center application deadline change. Um, in October, the board approved the eligibility and evaluation criteria for, for, for the 2019 uh, Stationary Master Plan Urban Center studies. Um, we opened up a call for, for studies shortly after that um, with the initial deadline November 30th. We are extending that one week to uh, Friday, December 7th. So I'm sure your staffs will be pleased if they're planning on submitting. So I'm sure they're actively working on that now. Um, so, so please get, get the word out about that. Eligible study sponsors are local governments, RTDs, nonprofits, uh, transportation management associations, business improvements districts, and the like. So, so please uh, get that out, get that information out to to the appropriate folks. Um, Dr. Carr, we hosted the Association of Metropolitan Planning Organizations Connected and Autonomous Vehicle Peer Exchange on November 14th and 15th. Um, the event was attended, obviously, by AMPO and ASHTO staff, F FHWA, and our own uh, Dr. Cog staff. We also had staff from uh, Detroit, Kansas City, St. Louis, Phoenix, Atlanta, and many others to discuss planning considerations associated with connected and autonomous vehicles, particularly in the modeling field. I think we've had some discussion in the past that really our travel demand forecasting models that we use really do, do not have any assumptions in those right now associated with the, the new revolution of technology that we're, well, we're actually in. Um, so nationally, I th it's a very big discussion right now about how we incorporate that into the model set. The last thing I wanted to mention to you all is um, we've been having some informal conversations with some of your city and county managers uh, around the region about the possibility of Dr. Cog hosting a quarterly city county manager forum, um, and we, we've we received nothing but positive response to that. So we are we're planning on hosting our first meeting sometime in February. Um, I, we thought, I, we really do think it's a great idea, and the true purpose is, is one, to build a stronger working relationship with your most senior staff um, at, in, within your communities, um, to discuss and make sure they are aware of, of the upcoming Dr. Cog uh, discussions and actions. Um, we really feel there's a void of that right now because we really don't have a, gr you know, a, a great relationship. I don't know how that sounds, but we, we don't have much of a relationship with our, with our, uh, with our county and city managers. Um, and then also share the products and services that Dr. Cog offers to our members. We want to make sure they're aware of that, as well as provide a venue for those managers to interact and learn from each other. So we're excited about that. Um, we will get the word out to your city managers real soon, but if they're on the fence about attending, Please encourage them to do so. That's my report, Mr. Chairman. So to add a little bit to Doug's, uh, the issue of parking tonight came up. If you come down here at night to this meeting or any other Dr. Cog meetings at night and the flashing light says the garage is full, ignore it. Go in the garage. So our apologies for them having the sign. Uh, Connie has been telling me that they're continuing to work with some of the building staff to get it figured out. But in the future, if you come down, if the garage light says full, go on in the park because we know it's not full. Yes, ma'am. Forty-two years and she hadn't figured out she has to turn the mic on. <laughs> <laughs> Well, she negotiated the lease agreement, so I'm not messing with her. <laughs> uh, the next item on the agenda is a period for public comments of up to 45 minutes is allocated now for public comment, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests for the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. I ask that the, uh, there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. Do we have anyone in the public who would like to address the board at this time? Well, you just got back part of your night. <laughs> so uh, the last board meeting, it was Westminster's uh, privilege to be one of the first to bring forward our community spotlight. And tonight we have the town of Georgetown. And they will be presenting to us tonight.
And as soon as she's done, we're going to tell you who the lucky winner is for next month. <laughs> okay. All right. It's my honor to tell you about my little town that I have lived in for, oh gosh, over 35 years. Um, so um, on January 28th of 2018, we celebrated our 150th anniversary of our incorporation. Um, first settlers came in 19, 1859. Um, the Griffith Mining Company was inco incorporated in 19, 1861. I'm going to have to get out of the into the right century. Um, and after the gold strikes um, kind of dried up, the population dwindled. Things moved really fast back then. Um, and But then once dis silver was discovered, um, it started to grow again. Um, and the two towns that had formed, Georgetown and Elizabethtown, were then incorporated. The discussion started in 1867, and in 1868, they were incorporated by the um, Colorado Territory, and 150 years later, we still operate under that original territorial charter. We're the only municipality in the state that does. So, uh, did it go? It didn't go. Okay, um, you probably have all heard, seen newspaper articles, news broadcasts on our new development, one of the largest ones in me recent history anyway. Um, the Bighorn Crossing will be going in, act actually groundbreaking took place this summer, and the third um, group of townhomes is under construction right now. Um, there will be 60 some odd townhomes, 70 plus apartments in three different buildings. The apartment buildings are the ones furthest to the right. And then over here on the left hand side, there will be a micro hotel and a brew pub. So we're very excited about that. Um, related to that development, though, we needed to do some upgrades to our water, water treatment and wastewater treatment plants. So those improvements are also underway. Um, our lagoon, which is there's there's two sections of our water body of water there. The one for the closest to Denver, which is actually north, not east. Um, because of the way the valley runs and the highway takes a turn. Um, that's the lake. And then south of that, on the other side of the 22nd Street Bridge, is the lagoon. Um, as you see in the lower portion of the, the water there, um, that's a lot of sediment. They were building sandbars, and it was sort of spontaneous wetland areas and um, duck habitat and so on. So um, we, a couple years ago, started talking about how, what the best way to deal with that was. We needed to protect our water rights. Um, where is the funding going to come from? So we did get funding from a CWCB loan grant. Um, CDOT contributed a good sized portion. And we also got assistance from City of Blackhawk because they also have water storage rights in our lake and lagoon. So, and it is very nearly completed. Um, luckily, the timing was such that the fill that got dredged out of the lake, the lagoon, was able to be used on the Bighorn Crossing construction site. So it didn't have to be hauled off. Everybody saves, everybody wins. 
Um, the other big project we've got, um, hopefully ready to launch as soon as the grant approval comes through, we are, have our fingers crossed, um, is our gateway expansion. Um, when the highway came through, the interchange shifted where people came into town and they no longer got um, immediately channeled through the the downtown area, um, it's the interchange is approximately a mile away from the downtown. And so as the businesses around the interchange have grown and expanded, the downtown struggles. Um, we used to take in 65% of our sales tax revenues in the historic downtown. It's down to about 40% now. The rest is... Um, closer to the interchange. So the the challenge was how to bring people all the way into downtown. We don't I mean we like being the the hidden secret but we're not trying to hide it. So um, the as the picture on the left hand side you see is the section of road that's already had the gateway improvements. It's got medians for landscaping. It also separates the roadway from the business parking that's just on the other side of those medians. Um, it's got light, the, there's hangers from the light poles so we can hang flower baskets in the summer. There's a hanger for flags. It just cheering things up. Um, so right about where that car is as it's heading down the road is where things change, where it stopped. 11th Street is where a lot of people end up, oh, there's nothing further on. We're turning around and going back on the highway. So um, starting with our master plans in 2000, updated um, the gateway master plan was developed in 2002. Um, and then the update in 2016 to our master plan re-emphasized the d desperate need for a plan to bring everybody as, as easily into downtown. The photo you see on the right-hand side shows how uninviting it kind of is. Um, it's just roadway. There's no sidewalk. Um, it's really narrow. Um, walk along it at your own risk. There's also a lot of fill, um, sort of a rock slope fill from the, the highway slope um, that we weren't really aware how much right of way we actually had for Argentine Street until it was recently surveyed and then we realized oh, we've got more space than we ever dreamed. So what's going to end up happening is the Peaks to Plain bike path will go on the right-hand side of that road. The sidewalk, pedestrian way, will be on the left-hand side along the creek. And things will be realigned and widened. Um, and it'll bring people right down to 6th Street um, with lighting and landscaping. So we're really excited. So the, um, the grant presentation was done in, on Election Day. And we've got our fingers crossed, and we're hoping for the best. So um, that's going to be what we're, we applied for, a $500,000 grant. So, um, and there were other partners, um, Freeport McMorrin, um, XL Energy, um, uh, DOLA, um, and also our, um, our TAP grant that's managed by CDOT, we got. So a lot of funding from a lot of different places. Hopefully, as soon as the, the grants get approved, we can break ground. We're also doing um, infrastructure improvements for water and sewer in several sections of that road so that that gets done be ahead of all of the gateway expansion. Um, and lastly, the exciting piece was the ballot issue for Parks and Rec. Um, we've been struggling along with um, eight recognized parks, a lot of other sort of green spaces, and really only enough funding from our regular sales tax to do a seasonal part-time employee and very minimal maintenance on 
basically three of the parks. Um, so we approached the citizens for a one half percent sales and use tax increase and they approved it. Thank you. Um, it'll sunset in 10 years. It's expected to bring in 115,000 in the first year. And we hope also to do a parks master plan to better direct our efforts. Um, there's a lot of ideas floating around out there and we need to see what the what the population really wants and needs. So, and on that note, that's a view from the, it would be the north end of the Georgetown Lake. There is a new bike path that opened a couple years ago that completely encircles that port, that lake um, called the Tom Benhoff Lake Trail. And there's a bridge across the dam at the north end and it's a complete two mile loop and it's just gorgeous. So come visit us. <laughs> Thank you. So I know you're anticipating whether or not you get to be the next person up. And that was chosen a, few, uh, a little earlier tonight. And uh, Mr. Jim Dale, the town of Golden is uh, next up. <laughs> so, so the challenge is out there. December. December. Oh, yeah. December, I Yeah. <laughs> Almost. All right, moving on to our next item. Uh, I need a motion to approve the consent agenda, please. I have a motion, a second. I have a second. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion is carried. That included the minutes of the October 17th meeting. Uh, next item. This is the discussion on the selection of members of the nominating committee. Attachment B, Mr. Rex. Again. Thank you, sir, very much. Um, so, uh, yeah, it is. Uh, so the nominating committee is selected and then is seated every year, uh, and part of their responsibilities is to uh, is to recommend a slate of board officers for the upcoming year, which is uh, which will be voted on by the board in February. Um, they vote on uh, vice chair, secretary, treasurer. Um, that's the slate that, that's brought forward. Um, so the, at, at part of the, uh, the committee guidelines associated with the nominating committee, the actual board gets to uh, select one member of that committee. So uh, performance and engagement committee selects one, which they've done, and that's, that was announced earlier, was uh, Mayor Bukowski. Uh, finance and budget uh, was uh, Director Jones. Uh, City, County of Denver, they have, they, they get a representative and that is Nicholas, Nicholas Williams, Williams yeah. my understanding. And the board gets to select one and, am I missing one? Immediate oh, an immediate chair. past chair. So Director Roth was, will serve on that and the uh, board chair also gets to, to appoint somebody. So right now we're, we're going to, um, have we had any that expressed interest, no, Connie? No so no board members outside of those committees have expressed interest. We're taking nominations on the from, uh, from the floor. <laughs> Do we have any board members who would like Steve Conklin? Thank you. Any others? We could, we could come down to appointing, <laughs> but it's a lot more fun if you volunteer. <laughs> The only, the only qualification is you can't be running for one of the offices and be on the nominating committee. You'll throw your hand in? All right. Thank you, Mr. Teal. Any others? Well, for the board, nominate as many as he wants. I'll get to pick <laughs> one. And, and, I, and I am not a cheap pick. <laughs> Yeah, you do. Okay. <laughs> do we have any others to make sure? All right, since we only have two, I would propose the board consider this, that Mr. Uh, Conklin be the board selection, and Mr. Teal will be appointed by the chair. Any objections? Hearing none, you're done. Okay, so again, the nominating committee is made up of the following. I'll get it. So, the, so here's, here's what the motion will contain. From the P&E committee be Ron Rakowski, 
Finance and budget will be Elise Jones. City and County Denver is Nicholas Williams. Immediate past chair is Bob Roth. Board selection is Mr. Steve Conklin. And the chair appointment is Mr. George Teal. We have a motion on the board. And we need a motion on just the board's just pick, right? The board's just the pick of Mr. Conklin. We have a motion and we have a second. All those in favor of the board appointment? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Steve, you got it by a squeak. <laughs> All right, next item up, Miss Doc. Good evening, directors. Thank you for allowing me to come before you tonight. I always get to talk about the fun stuff, the budget. So um, I'm actually really honored to be here and pleased to be here and speak with you. This is my fourth year that I've um, overseen the agency budget, and I always appreciate the opportunity to be able to come before you and share with you um, from a financial perspective what we're doing and what our forecast is looking like for the coming year. So thanks for that opportunity. Um, for those of you who are newer to this process, I'll just inform you and, um, of, of how we go about doing this every year. So our process actually starts back in July, and that's when we begin formulating the budgets between the division directors, myself, and the executive director. In August, we go to the board workshop and we present the strategic initiative plan, which you'll see at the back of your budget. And that really informs the budget process. And we take input from the, the directors and, um, and again, use that to help us uh, move forward with our budget plans. In September, we take a draft budget to the Finance and Budget Committee, and they review the draft budget. It's their opportunity to ask questions or um, if they want revisions to make those revisions. In October, we bring the package that you're looking at today before the Finance and Budget Committee. And what they do is they vote uh, to move it forward to the board to recommend it for approval. So that's where we're at tonight. So it is quite a process that's been vetted by the Finance and Budget Committee. And I want to thank them for their help and um, the leadership of Director Stoltzman and that as well in, in helping us come to this final package that you're looking at today. So I'm just going to go over a couple of highlights and then um, leave time to ask for you all to ask questions. The directors are also here if you have programmatic questions that you want to ask as well. But first, we'll just talk about revenue quickly. Um, this year, our revenue is actually going to, we're projecting it to increase by about 2.6 million. And a large percentage of that, I will say, is due to our Veterans Directive Program. And I want to highlight this because it's something that we're really proud of, just not in the AAA, but as an agency, because it really has been a team effort. I think Jayla would agree um, to make this program successful. But this program actually keeps veterans in their homes. And I know that we've had, um, we've had the program manager come and speak to you about it. And so this program has grown to a $4.5 million a year program. So um, half of the increase this year that you're seeing is represented in the growth of that program. And uh, we're very proud of it. We currently have about 115 vets enrolled in this program and are projected to have about 135 in 2019. So it's the second largest of its kind in the country. So we're super proud of that and I wanted to highlight that. Um, there's also some increases in federal funding due to state funding for senior services. And then also um, our AHC grant, which is a Medicaid grant, uh, we're actually starting to pay the providers for the data that they're providing on that uh, program. So that also has to, um, that's also increased our revenue projections for the coming year. So that's an overview of our revenue. Of course, as revenue goes up, expenses do too. <laughs> we are pretty much a dollar-for-dollar dollar reimbursement agency. So um, again, a lot of the increase in our spending this year does come from that veterans program. As we're bringing in money from the revenue, we're putting that back out into the community um, to the to the veterans. So our contractual costs have gone up quite a bit because of that. We're also adding nine new positions in this year's budget. A majority of those are in the AAA. 
and they are going toward um, in-house services such as ombudsman, our transitions teams, um, also SHIP, which our state, is our state health insurance program. Um, we're adding positions to that as well. There's also two additional positions that we have budgeted uh, for mobility services and economic forecasting and, and things of that nature. So those represent the increases in our expenses. I will note that our non-personnel expenses are actually remaining rather flat, which is, which is good news. So we are keeping costs down, even though the agency is growing. And then our fund balance, we are projecting that to increase by about 300000 this year. And just so that you know, our auditors year over year have recommended that we have a fund balance equal to about three months worth of spending. And that is, uh, would right now range somewhere between eight and nine million dollars. Our fund balance is a little bit below that, so we are working to increase that year over year and try to get to a little bit healthier um, spot there, but no worries, we're getting there. <laughs> And the last thing I just wanted to share with you was I think it's important for you to see year over year how we're growing. As I stated, this is my fourth year, and just in the four years that I've been here, the agency has really experienced a lot of growth. And you'll see in this chart here that um, just over from 2018 over 2017, we grew by 20%. And this year, we're growing by another 11%. So if we look back to 2016, we're growing by about 31 32%. So we've grown a lot. But what's great about that is, this is these are dollars that are going back out into our community and really making an impact in our region. So I just wanted to highlight that as well, that we're growing and we're serving more people and making a greater impact. So that's my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions that you have. And again, the directors are here as well. Any comments or questions? Yes, ma'am. Use the mic, please. Hello. Okay. What is the name of the veterans program you mentioned? It's Veterans Directed Care. Other questions? Ms. Dolsman. Thank you. I, I would just like to thank uh, the staff for the professional and very transparent process that's been put forward and for answering all of our questions along the way. Um, it's been helpful. And most of all, thank you for working to diversify the funding streams. Just knowing all the challenges there are with federal funding, that's been really impressive and important. And I appreciate all the work you've done on that. Any other comments or questions? What I have is a move to adopt a resolution approving the Dr. Cog 2019 budget. Do I have a motion? So moved. I have a so moved. Do I have a second? Bud Starker. Okay, you got the second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please signify by aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, motion is carried. Chairman? You got to turn it over. Yeah, I know, I got it. Mr. Chairman, um, just real quick, I, I'd like to just, because I, I meant to do this in my executive director report and I did not do it. Um, as with Roxy, with Roxy retiring, it was an opportunity to, to evaluate the, the administration and finance division here at Dr. Cog to make sure we're, you know, it's as efficient and effective as what, what it can be. Um, and we, in consultation with senior staff, we have decided to make some changes within admin and finance division. Um, the first was, of course, to name a new division director. And I'm happy to report to everyone that the new division director for ANF is, in, is Jenny Dock. Um, we're very excited to have her at the helm, and I've, I mentioned this in Finance and Budget Committee. I mean, when I mentioned that to staff, staff was like, well, duh. I mean, everybody didn't figure that was going to be the case. I mean, I think that just speaks to to the uh, tremendous work that Roxy, do, or sorry, that Jenny does. Um, forgive me, Jenny, you're going to be hearing that a lot, I got a feeling, uh, <laughs> that Jenny does at the agency. Uh, so she will be... Uh, uh, maintaining her current responsibilities related to uh, her account uh, accounting services. She also will be uh, taking on the uh, IT team, will, will fall underneath her, as well as some other office management functions. Um, the, the human resources right now is, is, is housed within admin and finance. I've decided to split that out as a separate division, and we're hiring a new uh, division director for uh, human resources. And that job posting, if it's not out today, will be out, be out tomorrow, and it closes December 18th, in case you know somebody's interested. Thank you. Okay. 
Next up, Mr. Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, this has to do with the conflict of interest policy. Uh, the board, those have been around for, for about a year or so, um, asked the P&E committee to add to its work plan an item to consider enhancing the conflict of interest section of the board rules of conduct. Um, the result is, uh, uh, is a recommendation, and that's located on page uh, 40, 48 of your document is the attachment that's included in there, and the, the new text that is the recommended by the Performance and Engagement Committee is highlighted in yellow. Um, and really, there's three, I think, feel there's three separate sections to this. The first paragraph really um, provides greater definition to what a conflict of interest may be. Um, and uh, we even, right in the middle there, it talks about um, uh, a business in which a member holds a substantial interest. Those words are in there. We, we attempted uh, to define what a substantial interest was, and you can see that in the remainder of that paragraph. Um, the second section, which really incorporates um, the next line after the first paragraph and the two indentions, uh, really talks about what would happen if a conflict were to arise and what the appropriate action would be or should be. And then the last section um, is really more of a reminder, if nothing else, that you know, equally important than just the true letter of the law that board members should strive to avoid situations um, where there is a perceived conflict of interest as well. And I, I was very happy with uh, with the language we ended up having, I'd be welcome any performance and engagement committee members, if they feel so, to uh, to comment on the comment on the uh, proposed language, or they, like myself, would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Comments or questions from this board, Mr. Dyack. Thank you, Chair. Um, when I first became chair of the P&E committee, uh, we were tasked with this. Uh, we we talked to staff. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, is there a reason why you're turning around? <laughs> wow, that's up close and personal, folks. Um, so we uh, we talked. We talked about this at uh, at length with staff. Staff then went out over a number of months and talked to municipalities, other, uh, other COGS, and uh, came back to us. Uh, we, had, we had discussion, I think a pretty full, a full discussion. We really didn't have a whole lot of comments looking around the, 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 uh, the room. Um, I think the uh, committee really thought staff did a very fine job at giving us what, uh, what we asked for. And um, I'm also uh, asking if there's any additional comments. Love to hear them. Thank you. Ms. Christman. <laughs> Put you and Doug together. Oh, uh, yeah. Is that okay now? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would have two changes that you may want to at least consider. Is if somebody serves as a uh, corporate board of director, because they don't always have a 5% interest, but they, uh, there's an awful lot of independent corporate directors. And the other one would be if they serve on the board of a not-for-profit that may be benefiting That's it. Director, if I may, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Um, so I, I assume that would be in the first paragraph somewhere, Director? So related to, can, can you speak specifically to where it might be in case we include that in the motion? Okay. <laughs> we can come back if you want to have a look at it. Okay. Other comments or questions? Ms. Jones? Click the happy face. <laughs> Thank you. Happy face. I like that. I just wanted a clarification from Director Chrisman. Um, serving on a nonprofit board in and of itself should be a conflict or is if there's a monetary decision that favor impacts the nonprofit board okay I'm fine with that other comments or questions in regards to the proposed additions you got where you're gonna put it <laughs> I know, I know Laura's looking. 
right before the which or oh one of those ors so would be so what were those two again director Christmas or go to the mic use the mic I know you hate that thing there you go okay um, serves as a director on a corporation or company that would uh, accrue a financial interest or gain from this. Same with serves on a board of a not-for-profit. I guess you could see either. Or non-profit. That, that would benefit, I mean, not-profit or for-profit. Um, that's it. I don't know where it would go. All right, does everyone understand the, it, the intent of what uh, Ms. Christman is trying to add? Is there any question or concern with the proposed addition? All right, so when we get to the motion, if you will uh, please make that motion as amended, then we'll try to incorporate it and make it work out right. But yeah. that'll take care of the amendment. Ms. Stoltzman. So I would like to make a motion uh, to approve our amended um, Dr. Cog Board Director Rules of Conduct and give staff some latitude to incorporate the intent of what was discussed this evening. Okay. And subject to legal counsel. That'd be great. Thank you. Second. Okay. So we have a motion, and the second was Ms. Lynn? When? There's your? Okay. Okay, we have a motion and a second for the approval of the motion as amended. Is there any comments or questions? Seeing none, all in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstention. Motion is carried. All right, Mr. Heliphant. Item 13 in your package, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, Matthew Helfand, Senior Transportation Planner here at Dr. Cog. Uh, Transit Asset Management, or TAM, is another set of targets that MPOs must adopt. I know you've already adopted several. Um, for the purposes of TAM, RTD is federally required to set its own targets, while seven smaller transit agencies in the Dr. Cog region participate in a statewide group TAM plan uh, that's sponsored by CDOT. And those are uh, Castle Rock Senior Center, uh, City and County of Broomfield, City of Blackhawk, City of Lakewood, Littleton Omnibus, Seniors Resource Center, and Via Mobility Services. This CDOT group plan sets one uh, statewide set of targets for the 53 participating agencies based on the averages of all their targets. In coordination with FTA, Staff believes it's appropriate to support RTD's targets while acknowledging the statewide targets for the smaller agencies that participate in CDOT's group plan. RTD's targets are in your packets this evening, and you've had a chance to review them. We have uh, Lou Cripps from RTD uh, to give an overview of their TAM plan and the target setting pro uh, process and take any questions that you may have. Right, thanks. I'm sure everybody's uh, just dying to hear about transit asset management. So tonight we're just going to hit on a couple key issues, kind of what are some of these acronyms, a little bit of background, and what is a transit asset management plan. Uh, fundamentals, when you think of asset management, the best way to really think about it is a management system for assets. A lot of people are familiar with financial asset management. This is a little different. This is physical asset management. And the main difference is that it's balancing the cost opportunities and risks against the desired performance of assets to achieve organizational objectives. Our purpose, of course, at RTD is to move people. Assets exist to move people. This term state of good repair gets used a lot. I think it's important for everyone to really clearly understand the definition from the federal government. It's when a capital asset is able to perform at its full level of performance and it does not 
It performs at its design function. It doesn't pose an unacceptable safety risk. And its life cycle investments have been met or recovered. So this last part, met or recovered, can be a little hard to, hard to grasp. And the example that I've been using is if you have a house, the roof is supposed to last 20 years. At 20 years, you can't actually replace the roof due to funding. It might need to go to 25 years. Then on year 26, you get a roof leak. Pretty soon, you have some internal damage. It is possible, though, to then put a new roof on, then repair that structural damage, drywall, paint, all of those kind of things, and recover that asset into a condition of state of good repair. So now let's talk about laws and rulemaking. Really, if you look at the law, it's, it's prescriptive and it has an emphasis on accountability. These are the requirements of a TAM plan, which is a transit asset management plan. Again, it's the plan for our assets. Those are the um, requirements. And then there's some deadlines. You have to have an accountable executive, which is named as your CEO. And then finally, if you're not compliant, then you would no longer be grant eligible. Um, along with this, the federal government is telling us that there's been this fundamental shift, this emphasize the need to maintain, rehabilitate, and replace existing asset or transit investment. And then in the very next section, they tell us that there's not enough money to do this. So where are we at today? Um, we are fully compliant as a transit agency, and we're actually um, have been ahead of this rule for a long time. We didn't start on this um, when the rule came out. We actually started a couple years ahead. We saw the wave coming. Uh, we saw the wave approaching, and we started paddling. So finally, this is kind of a uh, don't believe me. The federal government actually sent out a tweet and put it on their LinkedIn page. And they presented three transit asset management plans to Congress as good examples. RTD was one of those. Um, anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Yes? Do. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know how the. Thank you. Um, do assets include the station infrastructure, like benches and windscreens and that sort of thing? So the level of granularity is more generally at the station level, and then the elements of the station would roll up to that station level. Other questions or comments? This uh, presentation was presented yesterday at the RTC, and this received the unanimous approval by the RTC to move it forward to the board tonight. No other questions? Comments? OK. In that case, yeah, I will uh, recommend a motion to approve for the approval of the TAM targets as shown in the attachment agenda item number 13. I have a so moved by Mr. Brockett. Second. Mr. Deal. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion by the board? Seeing none, all those in favor, of aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion is carried. Thanks, Mr. Mr. Cottrell, I think you're up next. Thank you and good evening. Um, so if you're following along, we are now on attachment F. Uh, this is concerning the regional share funding allocation. So in accordance with the adopted 2020-2023 TIP policy, uh, a call was issued towards the end of July for the regional share. And projects were received um, from each of the sub-regional forums, RTD and CDOT, in late September. Uh, 20 projects were received, uh, totaling a little over $109 million. Uh, unfortunately, there's only $31,955,000 $31, available for this call. Um, the applications were then reviewed for eligibility and scored by Dr. Cog's staff. Um, as a reminder, the, or I should say the 
after the evaluation and the submittals, or the, they were scored, um, they were passed along to the Regional Share TIP Policy Review Panel. Um, and just as a reminder, the review panel is made up of one um, technical representative from each of the eight subregions, um, one representative from CDOT and RTD, and three regional subject matter experts. Um, after uh, deliberation over four meetings, the review panel uh, did recommend eight applications, which ended up leveraging $196 million in projects. Um, but at this time, I certainly would like to recognize, or staff would like to recognize the members of those review panel members who are, are in the audience. Um, so certainly if, on staff's behalf, if you could stand and be recognized for your hard work over those meetings. Thank you. Um, so at this time, I'd like to invite um, Steve Durian from Jefferson County um, up to the podium. Uh, he re will represent the panel and explain a little bit more in detail about the, the process that the panel took um, to recommend these eight projects along with the ranked wait waiting list. Steve Durian with Jefferson County. Uh, the panel that uh, reviewed the, panel, uh, the projects consisted of uh, a member of each of the eight subregions, one CDOT representative, one RTD representative, and three regional subject matters, uh, or sub subject matter experts. And uh, the, uh, the projects were initially uh, divided into a Tier 1 group and a Tier 2 group. The Tier 1 groups uh, basically followed the scoring uh, recommendations from Dr. Cog's staff. If you look at page 7 of your... Uh, of your uh, agenda, you'll see that uh, there is that table that has the scoring uh, column. And as you can see, uh, most of those top eight projects follow the top scores. In some cases, uh, there's some diff uh, discrepancies there. And that's because um, there were, in some cases, studies and design uh, efforts were prioritized in cases of ties. Um, but uh, that's, that's how we kind of came up with that top eight list. One thing to keep in mind is that um, the 16th Street Mall rehabilitation project from, submitted by Denver had a request of $20 million. And since only about $32 million is available, that was a substantial part of that. So uh, the city of Denver came back with a proposal to uh, reduce that uh, initially to an $8.15 million request thereby making room in that first $32 million available for several other projects. Otherwise, there'd only be three regional projects that would be able to be funded. So that's how we got to eight. Uh, as part of that, uh, the next uh, 10 point, or about $11 million that may be available in this regional pot should it become available would go to the remaining balance of that uh, 16th Street Mall project. Uh, and you can see that at the bottom of that table, there are several other projects that would then follow as money, if and when money becomes available. That's kind of how we came to our recommendation. And I'll give the floor back to Todd. Um, thank you, Steve. Um, so at this time, staff has, as part of this agenda item, has invited the sponsors of the eight recommended projects to make a small presentation to the board about each of those eight projects. So uh, I guess the first would be um, I think Scott McCary about the for the 119 BRT enhancements. Good evening. I'm Scott McCary with Boulder County Transportation Department. Um, and I was the chief author of the 119 BRT study or project. Um, so uh, the State Highway uh, 119 is the second most traveled corridor in Boulder County. Uh, it's right behind uh, US 36. Um, and we've done some fair bit of traffic analysis in the corridor. And uh, what we found is that the congestion, like a lot of places, is increasing, um, particularly at the State Highway 52 intersection. Um, every day we see uh, almost a mile of queuing in each direction. Um, if you've ever driven that corridor in peak hours, you know what I'm talking about. Um, we looked at the Dr. Cog 2040 land use projections, and it looks like um, it's only going to increase like uh, most of the areas. Um, Scott, could I ask you to hold it, hold that microphone? It, that one is it's real directional. If you're not right okay. into it, you can't hear very well. How's this? That's better. better. OK. Um, I'm Scott McCary, Boulder County. 
Um, the, the gist of what I was just saying is that traffic is increasing um, pretty dramatically on 119. Um, this, is a, this is really a regional corridor. We have employees, visitors, um, and residents from all over the Front Range that use this. Um, and we, we presented that data in the, in the, pre, in the application. So what are we going to do about it? Um, this has been studied um, a lot. This quarter has been studied a lot. This is not the first time we've looked at it. City of Boulder, um, City of Longmont, Boulder County, CDOT, RTD. It's in the Dr. Cog Fisley Constrained Regional Transportation Plan. So um, we were able to basically, this is largely a construction project, basically take the planning work that's already been done and um, put together a package of capital projects to implement some of these plans. Um, and I will say that we're really launching off the heels of the State Highway 119 BRT study that's being led by RTD right now. So um, briefly what the project is, there's three components. Um, in downtown Longmont, there's a Kaufman busway. Um, that's exclusive bus lanes on Kaufman Street. This can happen completely within the curb-to-curb -curb right away that we have already. This connects the first and main downtown station at Longmont to the Kaufman Park and Ride station, just under a mile long. Um, moving down the corridor to 52, um, well, let's go all the way down to Boulder first. So at Boulder, <coughs> um, the proposal there is to do bat lanes. So that's not flying mammals. That's actually business access transit lanes, um, the acronym that we like to use. This is basically extended queue jumps, but cars can also use that lane for right turning to access business driveways or, or um, cross streets. And then in the middle of the corridor, we have uh, State Highway 52 inter queue jumps. Um, like I said, the, the analysis that we've gotten from the BRT study is showing that we have a mile of queuing uh, <coughs> on both north and southbound directions. So we're proposing um, in here to have a mile-long, basically, bus queue jump lane um, so that the buses can bypass that congestion that leads to travel time reliability um, and increased attractiveness of the BRT. Um, the left arrow, um, there's one more. So <coughs> I will say that the final recommendations for the BRT study aren't going to be completed until, I think, April. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so we don't actually know which side the queue jump is going to be on. Either way, if you look at those diagrams, the cost stays the same, whether the managed lane, Q-jump lane is on the inside or on the outside, that still remains the same. But that, at that point, it's basically a function of paint of which side you stripe that. So we think the cost estimates, regardless of the final outcome of the BRT study, um, should hold true. So this is a collaboration of a lot of different agencies, City of Longmont, CDOT, uh, Boulder County, RTD, City of Boulder. So um, yeah, that's a quick summary. Thank you, Scott. Um, next, we have the 16th Street Mall project. Hello, uh, my name is Justin Begley. I'm a project manager for a city, county, and Denver. Of Denver, I am uh, not the project manager of the mall, but I will uh, walk you through a couple slides just on on uh, what's going on with this project. You may have heard about it recently as part of some other presentations as well. So briefly, um, the mall, the 12 and a half blocks out here, uh, blo a block away from us, opened uh, nearly 40 years ago. And by the time of uh, its reconstruction, it'll be about 40 years old. Um, it was built in the early 80s with uh, funding with an investment of the Federal Transit Administration, as well as uh, the city and RTD. Um, I can tell you, um, back in the early to mid 80s, uh, FTA was investing in these transitway projects nationally, and Denver got one of these projects. Um, transitway being a dedicated running way for rubber wheeled transit uh, buses, uh, was somewhat unique at the time. And so, 40 years later, uh, what do we what do we know about the transitway? What has it grown into or evolved into? Um, it, it, it really does serve as a multimodal regional facility um, serving uh, pedestrians, um, the mall transit service, and, and we know those bus riders are also pedestrians uh, at point of entry and exit. And on either end of the uh, transit way are uh, regional transit hubs, um, which can connect you to uh, the airport inner city bus service. 
um, regional commuter rail, so there's really a, a very large connectivity portion to what the mall serves. Um, so here at the time, uh, at the end of its useful life, we, we have some lessons learned. It's been under study now for several years. And there's definitely a, a few themes uh, and items that have emerged about the need to improve its design in order to facilitate better pe pedestrian safety. Um, I, I can tell you that uh, there's been study on, on the, the sidewalks of the mall, and at times they operate beyond their peak capacity, and having um, what we call the, me uh, the, um, the median design, or the symmetrical design, where the median is in the center, can actually result in pedestrians entering into the path of the buses. Um, we do have some blocks that are what we call asymmetrical, and those consolidate the buses at the center or the side of the transit way. And those have been found to be uh, up to five times more safe than the um, center <laughs> open areas where pedestrians can cross in front of buses. So um, that, in addition to a few other um, improvements, are why the, the mall is an important project. Um, so the, the benefits of the project, the, the safety, through the realignment of the running way, similar to what you just saw in the Boulder project, consolidating the, the vehicles in the center, uh, improved ADA access for folks who um, have limited mobility uh, and have challenges getting on and off the bus, um, the wider sidewalks, and then there are also maintenance issues uh, currently which lead to unreliable service at times. Um, and unreliable service, as the next slide will show, um, something we we try and avoid and we being the city you know owners of the right away but working with RTD and concert understanding it's uh, uh, important to keep the, the service running uh, with a with a reliability that's um, necessary to ensure confidence in the service so people who do travel into work downtown um, come into Union Station come into Civic Center Station can get on the bus and ensure they'll get to work on time so the crucial first and last mile connection for uh, commuters and visitors I mean, we know, uh, we understand through surveys that, you know, the majority of the mall users are not from Denver. They are a combination of both regional commute travel and visitors to, to Denver. Um, and there are surveys that also show that um, two and five uh, of the commuters that come to work downtown do take transit to get there. So we know that uh, some of those folks end up on the mall. In terms of the project, 75% um, of the project cost is being funded um, from local um, city dollars, uh, more than half of the total project cost is funded through a tax increment finance within the business districts around the mall. So we know that these improvements will go also to benefit um, the businesses along the mall, but they are paying their fair share into this. And um, we are uh, combining um, funds from different sources to help bring the, the, the full mall to its rehabilitation. So at the end of the day, um, we do believe it serves the tip focus areas that are mentioned here, and uh, I'll read what's up there, but that's uh, basically what I had to present, so thank you. Thank you. Um, the next is Jefferson County Peaks to Plains Trail. Okay, it's me again. I'm Steve Dury, and uh, my colleague Nancy York was uh, it's good, good to be here, but I'm going to sub in for her since I don't see her here yet. Uh, the Peaks Plains Trail is uh, is, is being um, proposed by Jefferson County Open Space. It's the third of four phases of a of a of a very uh, um, costly trail through a mountain corridor along US Six corridor uh, in Jefferson County. It, it is a part of a larger um, it visioned a project that would extend from Jefferson, uh, from beyond Jefferson County border. So it would go all the way from Glenwood Springs to the airport in Denver. Uh, it's a, a wide trail. It's a, I believe it's a 12 foot wide trail. Uh, it meets, uh, for the most part, ADA uh, standards. So it's an accessible trail for the entire community. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a top project on the governor's uh, list of. Uh, multimodal projects as well, so it is, does have a state um, priority associated with it. Uh, so we're asking for, I believe it's about four million dollars uh, in our grant request, and uh, we'll be partnering with many other communities in the Jefferson County area to help fund this project as well with our local match. Uh, so that's what I know about it.
Uh, thank you. Um, so the next presentation is from Arapahoe County, and it concerns the High Plains Trail, Cherry Creek Trail connector. Good evening, Josh Tennyson from Arapahoe County Open Space. I'm our Grants and Acquisitions Manager. Um, excited to be here this evening. Uh, today, people in the southeast uh, metro area really have no direct link to the regional trail network. Uh, Parker Road and other major arterials, including E470, um, stand as significant barriers to pedestrian and bicycle uh, mobility in this area. Uh, this trail project, uh, highlighted in, in red there, um, really will change this dynamic. It includes a pedestrian bridge over Parker Road, State Highway 83, um, and it will link multiple regional trails, including the Centennial Trail, which runs along E4, the southern part of E470 and C470, the Cherry Creek Regional Trail, and the new High Plains uh, Regional Trail, which is uh, in yellow there uh, on the right side of the, of the map. Um, this connection will also connect uh, two Dr. Cog subregions uh, with Arapahoe County and Douglas County. And it's an outgrowth of a significant partnership between Arapahoe County, City of Aurora, Douglas County, the E-470 Public Highway Authority, and the town of Parker. Um, this is a rapidly growing area uh, in the Denver metro area. Um, and this is really the, the missing link in the southeast metro region. And it'll connect tens of thousands of people to the regional trail network. Um, Dr. Cog funds, uh, we've requested $2 million, which will specifically go towards the construction of uh, this mile segment of trail, including the bridge over Parker Road. Um, the project partners, uh, shown below at the bottom of this slide, have agreed to fund uh, the, the remainder of the project, as well as uh, the remainder of the, de <clears throat> the design work. And we're aiming for con construction in 2021. Um, the, the slide here is a rendering of, of the bridge that will go over Parker Road. And on the top left there, you can see a bunch of children. Um, this is actually taken from this last spring. And this is really one of the highlights of this project. Um, on the west side of Parker Road, the project will land into the county's 17-mile uh, house farm park, as well as the, the Norton Farm Trailhead. Um, and this is a significant historic area where children come to, to learn about uh, our history as, as well as our, our natural areas. So um, we're excited uh, and, and invite Dr. Cog to, to be part of this partnership. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so next we're going to stick with Arapahoe County, uh, but move on to the US 85 PEL study. Thank you, Chair, uh, Board, Executive Director Rex. <laughs> Um, I'm Brian Weimer. I'm Public Works Director for Arapahoe County and actually the chair for the subregion of Arapahoe County. Uh, this project is a planning and environmental linkage study, PEL study, on US 85 uh, Santa Fe between C470 and Alameda. Um, it is a process in which we will look at transportation, environmental, community, uh, economic goals um, all up and down the corridor. Um, it is a missing link. Uh, currently there is the central I-25 study going on and a study that was completed by Douglas County uh, which was an e EA and a PEL on US 85 going south. Um, it has regional connectivity. Um, it is an alternative, as you can see to on the map, uh, to I-25. And if you remember the fires last year, on, uh, or this year, earlier, on I-25, it became a significant alternative to I-25. Um, it services three sub-regions, which is you know, regionally significant, those sub-regions being um, Douglas County, Arapahoe County, and the city and county of Denver, and arguably serves um, Jefferson County residents. Um, there are seven funding partners associated with the project, Arapahoe County, Douglas County, uh, city and county of Denver, CDOT, Littleton, um, Sheridan, and Englewood are all partners. Um, there is light rail along the corridor. It has a significant freight component. And there's also the Mary Carter Greenway, uh, or trail system, which is the Platte River Trail. 
So what are we trying to solve? Or what are we looking at? And there's issues along the corridor, and here's some of them that we've identified. Uh, there's intersection and operational uh, issues, congestion. Right now, the mobility grade along the corridor is a D and an F. There's access challenges. Various communities that operate signals. So there's linkage and operational issues, challenges with that. There's at-grade railroad crossings, um, crashes. Safety is an issue. So the graphic that you see there with all the little dots are accidents, um, crashes up and down the entire corridor. Um, the left to right is the length of the corridor. The individual locations would be intersections or locations along the, inter along the roadway, which uh, shows the number of crashes that we're dealing with. Connectivity is a big issue to the light rail, as I talked about. And uh, Santa Fe is really a barrier to accessing the uh, Mary Carter Greenway or the trail system. So pedestrian access becomes uh, an issue. Mobility, obviously. Uh, there are some um, green space that's available where development can occur. So what type of right-of-way preservation is needed? Uh, reliable trips. Right now it takes 64 percent longer during the peak hour and that's projected to go to 10 times or 100 times that uh, in the future in 2040. So how do we solve those issues? Um, vulnerable populations, as well as a diverse um, type of land use where we have retail, housing, um, industry up and down the corridor, as well as some of the other uses in terms of health care, and how is the HOV usage being utilized. So those are the type of things that we're trying to uh, find solutions for as part of the study. So hopefully that gives you a good overview of what we're looking at. Thank you. Um, so next we move on to RTD, Mobility as a Service, implementing an open ticket platform. Good evening. My name is Heather McKillop. I'm with RTD and I'm the Chief Financial Officer. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity to tell you a little about our project request. Um, currently, um, if you've um, purchased our MyRide um, cards and used that system, it's a card-based system where all the information resides on the card. Um, it's very cumbersome for the user um, and can take a considerable amount of time for your balances to show up and also be deducted on your card. When we implemented multiple years ago, it was state-of-the-art. Um, and now, as you can tell with most technology, it is not anymore. Um, however, we have been very successful in our mobile ticketing application. Um, we originally estimated that that would generate about 2% of our total fare revenues in just one, use of, uh, one year of being available. We're up to about 5% of total revenue, and that was with one product on it, the day pass. Um, the week before Thanksgiving, we introduced a three-hour ticket and, mobile, and a monthly pass on that um, platform. We have invested significantly in the back end of this um, mobile ticketing platform. And right now, we're to the point that we'd like to transition that to allow that to be used um, for a wider variety of our customers that don't want to necessarily use their um, uh, mobile phone to do that. Um, we're at the stage now that we need to purchase equipment. Up until this point, it has been all um, software and um, uh, back office setup. Um, but we need um, to move forward with validators. These validators would be um, moved from the platform right now where you have to validate your ticket um, onto the actual trains and then would remain on the buses. Um, and they would need to be replaced on the ex existing buses now. We're estimating the cost of this project right around $3.6 million. Um, we're asking for $1.8 million in grant funds. Um, and we. Um, think that this would be a significant improvement for our customers um, of the Denver metro region. Um, some of the benefits that they'll see is um, ease of use. Again, won't have to have a mobile phone, but they'll be able to use different uh, mechanisms to be able to um, pay. So we just need to be able to identify the person getting on the bus or train. And once we're able to do that, then they'll um, be tied to their account in the back office system, and it will be seamless for them. 
Um, the cost of the validators and the overall project is a fraction of the cost we're seeing in similar systems that have been implemented recently, and I mean recently the last couple years, throughout the country. Um, Boston and Philadelphia have recently um, completed their implementations. Boston's was $100 million, and Philadelphia's was closer to $50 million. Now, they are a closed system, which means you have to go through gates and stuff to get there, and ours is an open system, so it makes it a little easier for implementation. Um, and this um, uh, uh, software and um, uh, platform valid or validator system has been used in Europe consistently, and we're just now starting to implement that in the United States, but has been done quite successfully um, in the United States to date. Um, will receive um, basically the same success rate as those other agencies for a fraction of the cost, and will have much, much higher customer satisfaction. Um, this will um, be able to replace things like our EcoPass, our College Pass, um, the My Ride card, those type of things, which will allow for greater use um, uh, throughout the system on a, uh, on a much more um, uh, customer-friendly basis. Um, and hopefully that will encourage people to also leave their vehicles and if they have um, ease of use. The other things that we're working on right now related to this is integrated ticketing. So we're working with the CDOT and Bustang to be able to provide a platform where you can buy one ticket um, and be able to um, use that ticket um, across either CDOT system or our system at RTD. And we're also working with um, looking at other transit agencies in the state that use a similar platform so that we can perhaps um, provide an option that if you want to travel throughout the state, you could do it on transit if you wanted to, which is, has not been an option in the past from a payment system. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so next we continue with RTD to explain about a transportation transformation comprehensive plan. Executive Director Rex demands that the six foot four guy grab the microphone to speak to you. Um, uh, good, e good evening, Bill Van Meter with RTD. Earlier this year in March, our board of directors met to set strategic priorities for the agency in 2019 and beyond. One of the key strategic priorities that they set for the agency was to address future transportation means, needs, and methods. So they set that priority for staff and for the agency and for themselves. Some of the key things that they um, wanted us to look at in 2019 and beyond include looking at non-traditional fixed route public transit, focused bus service improvements, that list that you see up there, including what Heather McKillop, our CFO, just talked about, the account-based fare payment approach and completing the unfunded quarter commitments in fast tracks. So these were some of the priorities in the mix. The um, development that has come out of that is the direction to head towards develop, developing a what we're calling currently the T2 comprehensive plan. T2 stands for transportation transformation. We see the transformation, that the mobility choice blueprint that you've heard about, that Dr. Cog, RTD and CDOT are collaboratively funding and is um, coming close to wrapping up in the next weeks. Um, the changes in the transportation environment are impacting RTD today. How we deliver services in the future will need to change. We need to address that. We need to address financial and fiscal sustainability um, moving forward for RTD. We need to look at system expansion opportunities, bus rapid transit, potentially more rail, new alternative service types, all in scenario planning approaches. What's the workforce of our future look like, especially if we have automated vehicles, demand responsive mobility as a service, um, we need folks who can actually run an account-based ticketing system if we're successful in um, getting the grant um, that, and um, get your approval this evening. Workforce issues. So under the umbrella of a comprehensive plan, a two-year effort that we 
intend to kick off in 2019 per RTD board direction. We're looking for your support to help make sure this regional planning effort has good, strong stakeholder involvement, outreach, and sets a strong course for RTD to be successful for the next 20 plus years. Thank you. Thank you. So the final presentation uh, this evening uh, will be from Broomfield on the State Highway 7, um, Preliminary and Environmental Engineering. Good evening. Chair Atchison, members of the board, I am Sarah Grant, Transportation Manager for the City and County of Broomfield. Thank you for the opportunity to pre present to you tonight. The 26-mile State Highway 7 corridor between Boulder and Brighton is fast becoming one of the major east-west regional arterials in the north and will host a significant portion of future growth in the Denver metro region. It is anticipated by 2040 there will be 56,000 new residents, 38,000 new jobs on the corridor, which is a 44% increase from 2015. Total households are expected to increase by 74% and travel on the eastern end of the corridor is anticipated to increase as much as 60%, according to CDOT data. In the last five years on the corridor, there have been 10 fatal collisions, over 700 injury collisions, 97 of those involving a pedestrian or bicyclist. The 24 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan presents the region's vision for a multimodal transportation system needed to respond to the future growth and demographic trends. Communities along the corridor have embraced this vision and are planning for a multimodal corridor of local livability and regional accessibility through a diverse mix of land uses and high quality transit and attractive active transportation facilities. The project will create preliminary and environmental engineering plans to prepare for timely public and private transportation investment critical to ensuring a well-connected multimodal corridor to support the development of a mix of uses and densities in our urban centers. Next slide, please. Communities on the State Highway 7 corridor have been planning for the safety and multimodal capacity improvements, including two PELs spanning from 75th Street in Boulder County to US 85 in Brighton. Recently, the City of Boulder completed the East Araspaho Transportation Plan, and recently this year, uh, we completed the corridor-wide bus rapid transit feasibility study. This project will take the recommendations from the previous studies and develop preliminary pa plan packages that will allow you municipalities counties, agencies, and developers to rapidly invest in the corridor. The four specific elements of the project include the following. First, to develop preliminary engineering for priority projects from the plans to take on a higher level of design for accelerated investment. Second, right-of-way needs will be identified for the extent of the corridor, allowing responsible municipalities, counties, and developers to acquire and preserve the land necessary to build the improvements. Third, utility identification will be completed as needed. Fourth, environmental engineering will be initiated and necessary environmental clearances will be identified. The total project cost is $10 million. The regional TIP request is $4 million uh, from Dr. Cog. The three sub-regions of Adams County, of Adams, Boulder, and Broomfield are matching with $4 million of their sub-regional federal funds, also a 40% match. Every single jurisdiction on the corridor is contributing a local match of $1 million, including Adams County, City of Brighton, City of Thornton, Boulder County, City of Boulder, City of Lafayette, Town of Erie, and the City and County of Broomfield. In addition, CDOT Regions 1 and 4 are partnering with an additional non-federal match of $1 million. The match commitments demonstrate strong regional commitments and collaboration amongst the three subregions and local jurisdictions. On behalf of the eight jurisdictions on the corridor, we thank the board for their consideration of this project proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so that ends the presentations that we have for you tonight on the eight recommended projects from the review panel. Um, the motion before you this evening is to move to approve the regional share projects in ranked order waiting list to be included within the draft 2023 TIP with regional share funds. Both the TAC and the RTC both make a recommendation to you this evening. I will presume there may be some questions that are going in order to get to the questions I'm going to ask for a motion first and then we'll open it up to the floor for questions and comments. So do we have a recommendation for the motion? Ms. Jones? I'm happy to push put a motion for approval on the table. Is there? Do I have a motion and a second? 
Are there any comments or questions from any members of the authority that we would like to have for a discussion? Mr. Pfeiffer? Happy face? Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. I do have a question, uh, a little bit just understanding of kind of the Denver 16th Street Mall. So I don't know who wants to go up there just, and answer. Just, uh, but put it out and then we'll see who's going to run to the mic. Who's running the mic? Sure. No, go ahead. Mm -hmm. All right. So the question here is, okay, so I see the request is for $20 million. Got 9.1 million. I see that, that it was broken up into a second down below the line for 10 point, well, almost 11 million. I guess the question I have is, um, does the project have all of the necessary match to to meet that that project? In other words, I understand it's upwards to 130 million dollars. You asked for 20. Do you have minus 10? Do you have 100 and? $20 million matching. I will, uh, I'll do my best to explain the funding package. Um, so at the total project cost of $118 million, there's currently, um, I believe it's between 66 and $69 million identified from tax increment finance funds, which come, I believe, from the business improvement districts in the area. So. Um, that money, I believe, has been secured for some time now and actually has to be spent, um, which will accelerate our action on the, on the project. There was uh, $13 million identified in the general obligation bond approved by the voters in Denver, uh, I believe, last year. Um, that, that represents the local contribution. Um, there was also, I believe, a pair of grants, uh, federal grants, uh, one of which was an SDP Metro grant that came through Dr. Cog. Um, both, I uh, believe, through RTD might have been the lead on those. I think those total maybe about 13 or 15 million. So the outstanding um, difference on the project was the 20 million that was applied for, plus uh, 5 million in subregional funds that were put up to commit. Um, in the application, it was identified that a, s a smaller amount could be accepted um, to potentially if the project has to be phased to deliver a smaller geography of the, um, the mall, um, then the t full 20 million would allow us to complete it. So um, to answer your question in a very long way, um, all the funding is not currently secured. However, the project is phasable and um, the benefits that are explained in the application um, are still deliverable at a smaller scale. So, so you're saying that all but say 10 million is missing, you're going to have like a half a block that's not going to be fixed? Um, we'll have half a block we'll continue to seek the, the balance of the funding for. Just hopefully you're not doing something weird like that. Um, then, so let me ask you, what about the, just recently we had this project come up about, I think delay, I think I'm looking at my peers here, uh, delay discussion on it. And I'm a little worried that you're back at the water well again on something we just let you have an extension on, and then now you're back again and asking for money. I'm trying to understand. I just don't want to make sure we tie up this large amount of regional money to come back in a few years and say, oh, sorry, we're, we're delayed still. Um, when there's so many other good projects listed below that could be funded and are shovel ready today. Uh, sure. Um, and it, I wasn't part of that discussion, but I, I do understand what the board um, approved. and. And the project has to go for advertisement by January, or um, we, we do turn the funds back. On the last one, right? So do you think we'll repeat that same thing on this ask? Uh, absolutely not, because it'll all be, uh, the plan is to deliver it all via one design build contract, so um, it's all tied together. OK, thank you. Mr. Vudum. Mr. Chairman. I push the right button here. So uh, first of all, just for the record, uh, the uh, a project that the town of Bennett submitted, which had exclusively to do with uh, uh, safety of motorists, uh, finished dead last in the uh, in So the truth be told, uh, my tear ducts are not ravaged. My day has not been ruined. OK, but despite that, um, there are certain uh, aspects of the outcome of this that are disquieting for me. Okay, so my, my first concern is 
uh, I, I sense that uh, small communities did not fare well here. And um, people that have uh, more experience in these matters tell me that this is a, a, a very common a, a outcome because the previous TIP cycle, uh, small communities also fared poorly. So I have no idea where, where people are uh, thought-wise in this process, but perhaps other uh, directors that represent um, other small communities share my uh, disappointment. <coughs> my second concern uh, is that if we were to do a, a, a category uh, overview of the uh, transportation system in the Dr. Cog region, we would find numerous, numerous issues perhaps uh, numbering in the hundreds. Intersections that have uh, exceeded their design limits, on-off ramps uh, to 70 to 225, the fiasco on uh, uh, 270, numerous, numerous issues. And so what is the effect of this? Well, amid hundreds of thousands of people are stuck every single day driving to work in gridlock. And then uh, 4.30, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, the process is reversed. The same people are stuck in gridlock. Their car is burning fuel. Their wife, their husband, their children are waiting for them to return home. Okay, so in this environment, we have chosen, apparently, to deploy 63% of the total funds available, i.e. $20 million, uh, to what I will uh, uh, condescendingly call gussying up the uh, 16th Street Mall. Okay, so for me personally, this creates a bad optic. When our transportation system, when people are sitting on freeways day in, day out, stuck in gridlock, to spend $20 million on, on the mall is has a bad optic for me. And and may I just say this, I, I believe for the, for the taxpayers, the public at large, their sensation is gonna be similar to mine. Thank you for hearing my uh, remarks. Ms. Francone. Thank you, Chair. I also had some questions with respect to the funding. Um, I, I believe um, I heard you say earlier um, that I see the request of the regional fund chair request at $9 million, but you mentioned something about $8 million, $8.1 million. Uh, I think it was perhaps just a misstatement earlier because um, the amount in the packet is the amount that was recommended in advance uh, which I believe is nine million but I don't I don't have a packet thank you and um, with respect to this project at 16th Street Mall is the um, it, what is the status of the design um, for the the entire project my understanding was is that there was going to be a redesign of not just the roadway for the 16th Street Mall shuttle, but also the sidewalks and, and other amenities along that? I think there's been conceptual level design done. Um, the, the, I don't know what percent uh, necessarily has been done, but I, I know the project's currently um, in the process of getting its uh, environmental clearance document and going out, because it's going out for a design build, the bulk of the design function will be handled by the contractor selected for for that, and that would include um, expanded um, sidewalks and pedestrian access. <clears throat> so you propose to um, begin construction of the roadway surface before that design is complete? Um, no, it'll it'll handle it'll be handled um, via one contract, but the design will absolutely come before the construction. So I guess I'm having trouble understanding how you can cost this or estimate this or make a request for funding when you don't have a completed design. Um, the, it's my understanding that the cost estimates have been based on the design work that's been done today, which is a, at a conceptual level. It's not a full 100% design has been completed. So another question, please, um, with respect to this project. So it is it, it is the intention that this uh, 16th Street Mall project, the entire length of the 16th Street Mall, be resurfaced um, in granite? Um, <clears throat> as I understand it, the 12 and a half blocks, I believe either 
um, between Larimer or Market Street down to Civic Center Station um, be um, have the granite taken out and the sub and the subsurface re reset, and then granite will go back in. Um, above so the this is not the entire 16th Street Mall. This is just a 12 block section. Uh, the 12 blocks, I believe, it's either Market or Larimer to to Civic Center. Correct. Do you have the um, maintenance costs for 12 blocks of granite in the roadway? Uh, I believe current maintenance costs are somewhere on the order of a uh, million dollars annually. Um, by virtue of doing the project, the maintenance costs, I believe, can be reduced, uh, as I understand it, to about 300000 a year. I was previously RTD director, and during my tenure at RTD, I believe the board had um, moved to um, not support the resurface of the 16th Street Mall with a granite uh, roadway surface. So how does this come back again as a granite um, roadway surface for shuttle vehicles that travel every 90 seconds up and down the 16th Street Mall transporting roughly 50,000 people a day? Um, might be able to chime in on that. If, if I may, um, Director Francone. Um, so RTD's board took action this summer in regards to that. They expressed their um, continued disappointment with the approximately 1.2 million this year that we'll be investing in maintenance just of the transit way we being RTD, just of the transit way, um, and, and their frustration with the process that is dictating that granite be the paver um, approach because of National Environmental Policy Act, the hands of the city and RTD in partnership are tied. We cannot do a different material um, and on the mall. The process has led us to only one alternative. We worked that issue through with the City and County of Denver and with the Board of Directors. The RTD Board took specific action directing that RTD's capital contribution to this project be limited to those funds that had already been committed by RTD essentially authorizing Denver and RTD staff to move ahead under the auspices and um, requirements of the National Environmental Policy Act, which dictate granite. So granite has been uh, de facto approved by the RTD Board of Directors in return for Denver taking the lead on capital costs above RTD's commitment. Um, to date, RTD has also set a cap and made a commitment to Denver for ongoing maintenance costs in, in that same board action. So from the RTD board's perspective and with agreement with the Sydney County of Denver, that issue has been resolved and the granite is the only paving substance that can be used on that mall under the National Bo Environmental Policy Act. Just one more comment, please, or I guess a question. Um, I, my understanding was that, that in addition to the change or the request to change for the road surface from granite to anything else, um, operated as a material um, change to the federal, um, previous federal funding requirements that were there. So I guess I'm having trouble understanding um, it, it seems to me this is not ready for prime time here. Um, you don't have a final design. I have seen several designs for the restructure of the 16th Street Mall. So I guess my question is, is, is um, if granite is the only surface that you can use for that, how does that, how does a design that you don't really know what the design is going to look like now, how is that going to play into the federal um, approval or uh, you know or further funding um, for the mall if you don't know what it's going to look like are you going to run into the same problems are you going to run into further delays um, with this design process when you when you don't really know where you're going with it yet it seems to me 
Um, so what I can offer on that is simply um, the, the amount of design that's been done to date does allow us to have a relatively firm cost estimate um, and understand schedule and how long it will take. Um, the granite piece that was dictated through uh, NEPA um, is something we are carrying forward into whatever the final design yield. And when I say design, I mean the, the cross sections of the street are well understood, but um, there will be some more detailed design elements that will come as part of the design bill contract that gets awarded um, next year. Do you, do you have a picture of what it's going to look like? I don't. Ms. Shaw. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I guess, well, one, I, I wanted to understand more about how the NEPA study dictated granite. I mean, it doesn't dictate granite on our roads or highways or anywhere else, and I, I truly would like to understand more. I can take a first stab at that. The design of the mall was by I.M. Pei, a world-renowned architect. The, um, uh, yeah, and I'm not a historic preservationist, um, but the historic community, um, including the State Historic Preservation Office, have weighed in on the historical significance of the mall. I'm probably not using the exact proper legal and NEPA terminology, um, but have determined that there is historical significance. We've um, had other um, to the mall, and hence that is contributing to, not the only factor, but contributing to the restrictions towards keeping essentially the same character and design and architect architectural integrity of the original design um, that has made it such a unique place and asset to the city and the region and the state, frankly. Thank you. No, in fact, that helps me because to me, it seems like there might even be some um, differentiation between the actual transportation um, cost and the historic preservation or art of architecture cost that might um, be part of this. And I, I do want to make sure that we are expending our funds are very limited funds on transportation for transportation alone and not those others. And certainly it might be worth uh, chasing down a, a partner at History Colorado and see if they might contribute to the funding or uh, maybe the State uh, Economic Development Board. Um, I had one more comment, and uh, this does also hinge on the cost. Um, I would certainly prefer that other projects be placed at the bottom of the uh, list of the uh, several that we heard about tonight rather than dedicate the remaining funds to this uh, 16th Street Mall project. It's, it's absolutely important. It enables people to um, to actually use transit, um, but the that art of architecture cost is what what uh, throws me a bit. Thank you, okay. Mr. Williams. Just want to touch on a few of the comments uh, from this evening and kind of echo something Justin's already talked about. You know, I think it's easy when we look at the 16th Street Mall to think of it as a uh, pedestrian pathway, a great way to get to the Hard Rock Cafe. Uh, but in fact, the, the, the 16th Street Mall is one of the most critical arteries for transportation in the entire region. Um, it connects, obviously, two of the largest transit stations in the city, Union Station, Civic Center Station. Uh, during that, uh, the, the bus path goes along, intersects uh, multiple uh, light rail stations. And just, I think Justin talked about it on here, um, of the 82,000 daily riders uh, on the mall ride, uh, only 33 or 35 percent of those are actually Denver residents. The remaining two-thirds are residents from around the region who use uh, the, the mall ride to uh, get to work, 
or to get to other transit stations, so thereby allowing them to potentially use transit they wouldn't have otherwise been able to use. So just kind of some of the statistics. Uh, for instance, Adams County, about 10% of the riders have been shown to be uh, from Adams County. That comes out to about 6,000 folks a day that are able to utilize transit. Arapahoe, it's about 15%, uh, 8,800 transit users. And Jefferson County, uh, about 17%, looking at about 10,000 riders. Um, so it is um, not just a, a playground for Denver residents to, to get to different uh, stuff on the mall. It really is a critical transit artery for the city. And going to the cost, I, I understand um, kind of the feeling uh, that maybe other communities are getting left behind. Uh, when we originally came in with this, it was a $20 million request. Uh, through the scoring process, it scored very high on that. Uh, I think through the committee process and hearing the concerns of some of the smaller committees, we were able to come back and more or less chop it in half down to uh, $9 million on that. Uh, and that, but that won't reduce overall, as it was mentioned in the presentation, uh, Denver's providing 75% of the funding on this. So I, I certainly understand the concerns on this. I feel like Denver is uh, really attempting to pull their weight on this project for a project that really has a lot of regional benefit to this entire region. Thank you. Ms. Dolson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I would just like to speak in favor of the motion this evening. So first, I would just like to reflect on the process a little bit. Um, when I first started on the board, we were finishing up the last tip, and there was a lot of this same argument that's happening tonight. It was sort of my first meeting last time. So if it's anyone's first meeting in a few years, it'll be not your first meeting. Um, <laughs> but the arguments will be the same. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty much true. Um, in that process, there was uh, funding by project type. And so you could sort of more easily compare, like a trail was compared to a trail instead of having to sit here tonight and understand how you compare a trail to a bus rapid transit project to a study for tapping on the bus and things like that. So that, you know, that is very different tonight. Um, and in the previous process, there was also this second round of set aside where small communities were seen favorably. So there was a contentious discussion and vote that we needed to change that, that the old process wasn't equitable. And we did away with that way of doing things. And we decided we would have this very, very small pool of regional funding and dedicate almost all of the funding to these sub-regional forums where you could fund all of your sub-regional projects. So in my opinion, that's where where the small communities are going to have a chance. It, it would be very hard unless your small community happened to be in the heart of right in the middle of everything for it to compete in this regional pool. But I do think that there is a more than favorable amount of funding that goes into that second pool. I actually argued for it to be 50-50 with 50% going into this regional pool. I actually think it should have been higher than 50% of the funding going into this regional pool. I failed, that's fine. That's not how we're doing it. But <clears throat> I think that this, this process is actually very favorable to small communities um, and to sub-regional projects. And so I think it's important that we consider how these projects scored. Um, if I were Denver, I might not have been as courteous and split my project in half. Um, their project is, there are three projects that received a score of 2.5, and that's one of the highest scoring projects. So if we believe our process and we believe that we put things with the correct weight and, and you don't think that it, I, I mean, if you go that route, Denver actually should have gotten all the funding. And, and so then all of these other projects that they've made way for would not be funded. So I think they've been very gracious in that, in that um, way. I might not have been as gracious, so I appreciate that. Um, and then I just would also, you know, sort of like to say that I, I think the time to reflect as to whether or not these criteria or this split of funding is the correct way of doing things is at the end of the process and to say, you know, is what we set, set out. Uh, we can ask tonight, did the staff execute what we set out? And I think the answer to that is yes, the staff have set, have executed what we set out. Um, if we think we set out the wrong thing, we should correct that for the next time that we go forward. And I think we have an obligation to have a robust discussion around that. But tonight, I'm very supportive of the motion, and I appreciate Denver's graciousness. Mr. Partridge. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My comments are around the 16th Street project. Question and answer, if I may. Or question for staff and maybe the review panel to briefly give us the points of what were the criteria would I, I would consider this and I believe it's understand this this reconstruction project Could you just give us the maybe the five top points that you considered
I think I'm wondering if we should have the panel. So you're talking about the actual scoring and how Dr. Cog's staff looked at the scoring. Um, can I it doesn't have to be a real complicated answer. I want to keep it pretty right, simple. Maybe right. it is the three top. Um, so I think one thing to keep in mind is that there was not one staff person scoring this. This is the the scores that you see is an average of twelve Dr. Cog staff from all different divisions taking a look and and putting a score down and then taking the average and that's what was presented. Um, so take a look here. Um, the project did a a good job throughout all the categories. Um, I think it definitely was helpful in the in the final score to receive uh, a high percentage of leveraging. So they did receive the maximum number of points for that. All right, I'm, I'm about down to one one top one po bullet point, but I'm asked about three or three or five. We can just real quick get to it because yep. we got a lot of yep. discussion yet. Yep. Um, <laughs> All right, I'm doing this over multiple sheets, right. trying to remember the instincts of one project. Um, it uh, it did have strong partnerships. Um, it also um, was rated relatively high in terms of you know why is this project important to the subregion. Um, it was also under the MetroVision focus areas. Um, it scored high in improved transportation safety and security. I think that would be kind of the the top three or four where it did relatively well. Great, thank you. Was historical preservation one of the criteria that you based this on? It was not. I have a question for Denver. Have you looked at what the cost of this project would be if you were using pavement or concrete versus granite? Um, I can say that the cost of the long-term maintenance of the mall, um, there was an analysis done, and the cost over long-term maintenance for the granite versus pavement is considered to be rather marginal, not that significant. I don't have the numbers. Um, is, that, is that maintenance you're talking about, or I'm asking about the cost of the project? I think it's probably a yes or no answer. Did you look at pavement or concrete versus granite as a potential for this project? I do not have that information. I don't know if you do, uh, Bill. Sorry. I mean, based on what you just said, I, I, I think the answer is yes. We have looked in the past on this. Obviously, this is a 40-year-long project, and during that period, yes, that has certainly been considered. Um, but I think kind of going back to what uh, uh, Mr. Van Meter said, you know, for the sake of this specific project, that was not an option to continue forward with this. So we have looked at it in the past. I mean, we've, we've heard the concern before and we hear the concern on that. But for this specific one, that was not, uh, that was not one of the considerations. And I, I, I certainly understand that, you know, why look at it. But I also believe, too, there's always a process to change NEPA. There's always a process process change historical preservation, but I don't think it went down that lane. My comments really refer to uh, this being a reconstruction project. And I think when we looked at what we had, whether we were looking to do what amount to sub-regional to regional regardless, he came down to the 32 million roughly on the regional money that was available, even though we have other projects in there regarding other, other, uh, other standards where there's transit. But I'm going to refer to reconstruction. And this may be a fault of we all in the room that I feel a little bit duped here because reconstruction. I think that the understanding is that this was going to, for a reconstruction project, we are going to look at pavement or concrete. And maybe that's where we fell short. We didn't consider other types of surfaces going into that. And I think the new Jerusalem streets of gold, good thing we don't have Jerusalem in our region. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I really kind of just really challenged. Um, 
Now, I'm not one to say throw the baby out with the bathwater because I think Dibber's done a lot of work. Staff has done a lot of work. The region view panel has done a lot of work. And I appreciate cutting the project in half, but I really have a problem. And I think there's a lot in room too to say that granite is something we should be paying for. I think what we're all thinking, a reconstruction project is either asphalt or concrete. Um, I, I just want to ask staff, was there a scoring for the pavement condition for this project? No, there was not. I have some really serious reservations about that, but again, throwing a baby out with the bathwater, we're at list on the in the eight projects. I do question. I don't necessarily question that so hard when Denver has it split, but I would venture to say maybe there's an amendment to the motion coming that we remove this project if it's possible from the. Uh, the waiting list because that really concerns me because if there's overture in a project it goes to the waiting list and I can only certain I can only imagine that there's going to be a million dollar savings on one of the projects which would be quite a bit but a Denver I that first choice on the waiting list and Denver said no no think we'll pass it up but we'll stay in the waiting list did really he get challenged with that so I want to throw the baby out with the bathwater but I do have some serious consternation about the waiting list. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Henry. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate it. I happen to remember when the mall first started, and I loved it because I worked downtown. And at that period of time, 40 years ago, I know, it's hard to believe. <laughs> Look at this face. OK. I know 40 years ago, you know, I, I appreciated using the, sh the shuttle because of the fact that I was one of those commuters that came. But 40 years ago, Denver, downtown Denver, was the primary employer of the region. And the rest of us were bedroom communities. That's not what it is anymore. It's not the primary employer. In fact, they're, they're, the population around the 16th Street Mall that actually live there and work there has increased by three times the amount. So I would say it being a regional project is kind of iffy. Um, the fact that there's an awful lot of income that's drawn around the 16th Street Mall um, from the tourists, from the people that live there, so the retail tax and everything like that is tremendously helpful for the maintenance of, of the shuttle of the mall. Um, so I, I have some <laughs> reservations. now. In addition, the TIP policy states that the regional project selection should connect communities. There's no communities other than one end of Denver to the other end of Denver that's actually being connected. Um, it's supposed to greatly improve mobility access and provide a high return on investments to the region. And this project does not provide high return to the region. And that actually is stated in our TIP policy. Now, I would have rather have seen I-25 and Alameda than the 16th Street Mall, because that would have affected a whole lot more of the region than this is. We have so many other projects in the region that deserves the money more than the mall does. I, I think all of us are starting to have heartburn about putting the regional amount of money into a retail mall that wants granite for their, I, I can't even imagine some of the citizens that live around I-25 and Alameda believe, would, would like to see this money you know, going in. Another thing that I want to bring up is the fact that those people that live around the 16th small, the average medium income is $120,000 a year. The annual medium income in Adams County is 60000 so is this really, you know, is, is this really a good place to put the regional money? And I don't, you know, I think it, maybe we can make an amendment just to pull 
the 16th Street Mall off and take that $9 million and put it down into a, into a project that's lower on the list. Thank you. Ms. And Jones. obviously, I'll be voting against it. Ms. Jones? So I'd like to speak in favor of my motion, I guess on two fronts. One is um, I agree with Director Stolzman's um, points earlier. We directed staff um, to score based on a set of criteria using experts that we um, approved. They have followed through with the process. And I don't know, I think this whole thing starts to unravel if we start saying, well, we, we disagree with with staff, you didn't get the score right here. I, I, I think we start undermining the entire process. And and so I, I think that at, at that point, then we can call into question and, and, and start pulling apart the scores for, for every project here. I would also say, I guess I would uh, express my particular experience with the 16th Street Mall in my prior life before becoming an elected official. I still lived in Boulder County, but worked in downtown Denver. And I was able to take regional transit to downtown Denver because I could take the 16th Street Mall up to the Capitol to lobby at the state legislature and to the other meetings I had. And the 16th Street Mall shuttle enables a lot of people who live throughout the region to be able to commute in via transit and then get to where they're going without driving the, their cars. So I think there is a huge regional benefit that exists. We, we all struggle getting to this meeting because of traffic that's getting worse and worse. Can you imagine if the 82,000 people who use the 16th Street Mall shuttle didn't use the shuttle and drove? I mean, game over in terms of actually getting through town. So. Again, I, th I think we need to respect the staff's work on, this, on the process and the scoring. Um, if people want to talk about the wait list, fine. But um, I, I would encourage us to um, recognize that this is our first go at this regional process. We still have the sub-regional forms to also address um, other community needs and, and, and move forward with trying this out by approving this list tonight. Ms. Goodwine. Sorry about that. First, I have a question. Um, could you help me understand what the implications of pulling this project off of the list? I thought that I heard you say that the deadline is essentially January to put the call. So um, the larger, the, the entire project has, is going out for a solicitation by January, probably sooner than that. But um, this is the, some of the funding that needs to be made up to deliver the project in full. Um, if not, it may have to be phased. Um. OK, thank you. Um, so I, I really understand uh, the, all of the positions that have been stated tonight. Um, I think that for me, the, the big picture is that we have significant transportation needs throughout Colorado, throughout the Denver metro area. Um, and we have a very small amount of money that's not going to cover everything. Um, and you know, in Lakewood, we're certainly feeling the pressure. Um, we have growth. I hear about traffic complaints daily. <laughs> um, so I certainly, I certainly understand. Um, I, but I want to uh, second what Director Stoltzman and Director Jones were saying in terms of the process that we agreed to. Um, and, and then also, to me, this, this is a regional project. It's, it's been stated it's one of the most critical transit arteries. It's a regional transit hub. Um, and, and I think that that makes it worth investing in. It is close. I think that if we have further delays, that's going to make um, this conversation a lot more difficult if it has to happen again. Um, and I think Denver is very well aware of that. Um, and uh, the last thing I want to say is that while we are really strapped for transportation funding, I, I think it would be a long-term um, detriment to Colorado and to, to our residents if we lost the historical preservation of one of the most iconic parts of Denver. 
Um, and I think that that would be a little bit short-sighted. Um, so I, I will be supporting this motion, although I do think that it is, we're, we're all in a very difficult situation as we try to determine um, where these small amount of dollars end up going. So thank you. Mr. Teal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, it, my biggest problem with uh, the list as it stands is that when we talked about splitting between the regional and the sub-regional, regional projects were supposed to be transformative. They were supposed to be significant. Now, I had a conversation earlier this evening that asked, well, what the hell does regionally significant mean? Undefined factor. Well, it's sort of probably something that we'll recognize when we see it. And um, I, I too have concerns that I think we heard from uh, Director Henry that mall rehabilitation just doesn't meet those basic guiding ideas between splitting between the regional and the sub-regional. We're not transforming. We're spending the most amount of money on this list on a rehabilitation. I certainly hear and respect the comments made that tries to express the regional transit, the regional connected nature of the 16th Street Mall. But Director Vidum is 100% right. This is a big region, and we're devoting the biggest pile of money to a very small geographic area. It just doesn't really pass the smell test. As Director Henry said, there are other projects further down the list that, yes, I do realize do not score as high, but do fit the criteria for being transformative. We'll address transit issues far more people and use the 16th Street Mall. Oh, and by the way, there are probably a lot of the same people that use the 16th Street Mall. So um, I, too, would support, as Director Henry suggested, an amendment that would remove the 16th Street Mall rehabilitation um, from this list, move it down lower, and move up other uh, high, not as high scoring, uh, projects into funding. Um, you know, Director Jones, I, I really appreciate your comment on if we do ignore the, if, if we were to make that amendment and we're saying to staff, thank you for doing all this scoring, and, but no, uh, we're going to disregard it. And, and your comment on then the whole process starts to unravel. Actually, I, I kind of go back to what Director Vidum suggested, to let this go through despite our best intentions and best attempts to make a, um, a better system, to let this go through, we'll actually start to unravel what our intention was. Because we're undermining those original ideas that we talked a lot about a couple months back, that a regional project should be significant for the region. A regional project should be transformative for the region. I see transformation going on with the other items on this list. I see transformation going on with the lower items uh, that didn't meet the that didn't meet our eight funded items. I don't see a transportation with the 16th Street Mall guys. Mr. Brockett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, first, I'd just like to call out the, the regional collaboration that's happened on a number of these, which I'm really happy to see. And in particular, our subregion played a role in the State Highway 7 collaboration. And there are a lot of different counties and municipalities involved in that, including some quite small communities, I'll note. So I th thought there was some really good s work that went into that process. Thank you for that. And I just also want to speak in favor of the motion and, and throw in a, a couple words in, in, in favor of the 16th Street Mall. I, I think it does serve that critical uh, file, final mile function. You know, you get into downtown Denver some other way, and then you get to your 
um, hotel or meeting or job or whatever uh, using that, um, I think it does play an enormous role in regional transportation. But I, I wonder if we could maybe um, find a path forward with Director Partridge's suggestion, which is to leave, you know, Denver graciously agreed to have the funding reduced to less than half of the original request, leave that in the main motion and the main grant, but um, say, well, then that's it, you know, and so if there's additional funding that comes in, the, you all have to find the rest, the balance somewhere else. Additional funding would go to the other items on the waiting list. So I wonder if we can move forward with, with that amendment. Mr. Christman. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, just to start, I, I, I too was here in Denver when it was built. I believe it was transformative at the time. And I think that um, it continues to be um, important, uh, historic and transformative part of the region. But that being said, my question is really on whether it is ready to go. Um, and that is, and I may be wrong, but I think I perhaps am the only person in this room who has actually worked on trying to um, do something on a building that was designed by IM Pay. Um, are you telling us that NEPA has authorized and all of the historic organizations are all okay with really a massive redesign of IM Pay's original design? And all they're saying is just keep the granite and everything else is a go? That that been done? Savannah, Chair, go ahead. You can if answer. I may take a first stab at that. <laughs> it has not been finalized. The current schedule is indicating uh, completion of the NEPA analysis and a decision document from the Federal Transit Administration in support of that in the spring of this year. Still work, or next year, I'm sorry, spring of 2019. That does not preclude Denver from moving forward on the path that they have laid out for you, procuring a final design and construction procurement by um, January of 2019. The Federal Transit Administration, Denver and the lead, RTD in partnership, have spent the last year and a half, two years, um, working through that NEPA process, and I, I, I feel pretty good right now stating that under Denver's leadership and with the support of the Federal Transit Administration, that that spring clearance is quite reasonable to expect, and it's not a massive um, redesign. Um, the um, granite remains and the um, rattlesnake or Navajo rug pattern, which are a couple of the key elements, are being preserved and retained. So much of the original intent and um, structure, architectural structure um, of, of the mall and intent of the mall remains. Once again, transportation planner, not an architect or historian speaking, but um, I, I feel very comfortable representing that today. Has Historic Denver reviewed this and approved it? Approval, no. Review, they've been involved all the way through the process in regular stakeholder meetings. So they're aware of where the um, direction's going. They've weighed in. They're back to one of um, Director Francone's comments earlier and some of the other concerns. Um, that's why uh, a lot of the um, key design elements from IMPA's original design are being retained in the design that Denver is pursuing. Um, I don't believe they've approved, not at this point, which is why we're still talking about a spring date, but they've been along in stakeholder meetings and brought along in the process, and that's why part of the reason why Denver's be, been behind the eight ball, from at least my opinion, um, because they've been able to bring stakeholders along to a point where they're pretty confident that they can achieve these milestones. I don't have any other questions other than the concern that anything that has anything to do with IMPay takes for 
ever. All right, just so everybody's understanding, if you've already spoken, I will come back to you, but I'm going to get those who have not spoken first. Okay? Can I All just, right. Can I just answer that one? Sure. Um, Director Chrisman, to to your question about project readiness, I just I think it's we, sh we should all remember that the monies we're talking about this evening um, is for the 2020 through 2023 tip. The monies is not even available until October of next year. Um, so I, I want to keep that in perspective with regards to any of the projects, not necessarily just this one, but all of those, right? That um, Doug, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so you know, so the project. And any of the projects, if they're construction projects, would have to be initiated two years after after the year the money is alloc. Or, or, right, Todd. Yeah, yeah you're two years after the correct. the money is programmed for. So, yeah, within that period of time. So, if money is programmed for 2020 in the tip for this project, it would have to be the construction would have to be initiated based on our current rules by 2022 or. Because of the two-year delay process we have. Eight, uh, 18 months. I don't know what that means. Just lost six months. <laughs> okay, Ms. Walton. Thank you, Chair. I have a question about the wait list. Um, could you somebody discuss how the wait list process works? For example, if a project that is $2 million is cut, then how is then look for how far down the list or do you wait for bank the money so the the actual tip document does it will outline what the rules are and those have not been set because that will happen a little bit later coming up this spring but using the example of the current tip waiting list document let's say for example there was three million dollars available for funding um, for this wait list. We would simply go to the first project on the wait waiting list. In that case, if that was the 16th Street Mall, we would say, Denver, we have $3 million available. Would you, would you like to accept that? Within that acceptance, they would have to complete the scope of that project um, without any changes. So there is, so there is a kind of a cause and effect. I mean, they could accept that money, but they n know that they'd have to complete the scope as they originally submitted it to Dr. Cog. Um, and if, that, if it gets to be time you know, far out, they may you know, have cost es escalations that they're unaware of. So if they don't accept the funding, we would simply go to the next project, and that project would remain on the list. Okay, that's clear. Thank you. And um, I am in support of the amendment as stated um, in its motion. I, I, I think when you read 16th Street Mall and when you look at how this project is broken out into chunks, which it needs to be just about any transportation project around here does. So that being said, um, you know, on its face, it's it's a little difficult to wrap your head around um, the regional aspect of it. Um, and so I've been listening carefully to all of the different comments um, on either side, whether this meets the, the criteria of that regional project. But I, I, two things, I place a lot of trust in the work that we've already done and that we've already proved in the criteria that we've already put forth and but reviewed and voted on in terms of the point system. And I really put a lot of faith in the staff. Um, and the review panel that, that that's all taken been taken into consideration, discussed and approved and, and that's why it's here on this list. Um, secondly, um, my own personal experience, um, oftentimes if I'm considering, I drive everywhere, I have two teenagers, I'm in the car constantly, but if I am considering an opportunity to take public transportation and change my behavior patterns and set an example for my teenagers, um, then that shuttle is a big consideration on the answer, yes. So, thank you. Mr. Schrock. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, my question basically is with the uh, waiting list, and, and I would like to see it amended that uh, the first, if not the second, on the top of that list uh, be removed. 
uh, basically because the first two items take up another $31 million. Um, that money could be used uh, for quite a few other projects that are just waiting in line. Thank you. All right, Mr. Hudson. Awesome. Uh, I'm going to be very brief. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I'm the new guy, and um, so I don't have the historical perspective that a lot of you have. Um, I'm also new to Denver, five years. I appreciate the 16th, 16th Street Mall. It's, it's fun. It's enjoyable. I go there once a year. Uh, it's always fun to go and play. Uh, I also am stuck in traffic on I-25 every single day. Um, I live in Castle Pines. Um, that's where my constituents are. Um, and from an optics point of view, if I go back to my community and explain what Dr. Cog does, and they have $31, 32000000 million, and our top priority was to repave the mall as they drive in and out of Denver, I, I, I'm going to be run out of my town. I mean, I just think the logic of that is just really hard for me to suck up. As much as there is to do in Colorado to fix our roads, we pave the mall? I don't know how I can defend that. I, I just don't think I can. Um, as for the rating system, I, I don't know the staff very well yet. Um, I, I appreciate their work. Um, but ratings and, and, and numbers, and um, they're really a tool, right? They're, they're bringing information to us for us to make a decision. They don't make the decision for us. So we now look at the numbers, and we make a logical, informed decision. Um, my decision will be to vote no. Thank you. Mr. Beacom. I just wanted to make a, a comment about the regionalness of the mall. I've been here since they built the mall. I was here before they built the mall when it was just 16th Street. And the, including this area, wasn't necessarily that good. Um, and I first came to this town in 1964 and got off the train station, walked out of there, and I was in the middle of the worst place I'd ever been in my life. <laughs> and I used to tell people I was so amazed that someday later I would say, I work in this neighborhood and I'm proud to be working in this neighborhood. And um, so that's my background on that. Now, as to the regionalness, the people that ride public transportation are several types, but basically it's people trying to get to work or across Denver metro area. And the people that ride the bus, some make choices. When I ride the bus, I make a choice not to drive. Some people don't have that option to make. They ride the bus, and from up north, there's now some trains that can be ridden to get down here. But the airport line comes into the Union Station. Union Station has been made into a huge transportation hub in the Denver metro area. And the other part of this city is over there at uh, Civic Center area, which is where the Supreme Court, the governor, Congress, all the people that you do. I take every opportunity to take the express bus to downtown come across the mall when I have to go to the um, state house or do anything on that side. But there's a whole nother group of people that come in from the north that come down here to work or to do things, and they can't afford not to be able to get across town from one side to the other so that they can do their work. And while I take an express bus when I come down, I take the 122, occasionally it goes across, but it takes trip from Broomfield to Denver takes less time than it takes from Denver to uh, 15th and Broadway. And so if you get off the bus at the other side, you can take them all across and you can beat the bus probably just about every time because of the traffic that's on the, the streets. So I think that the rehabbing or the reconstruction of the mall is a major regional project that's necessary. If it doesn't occur, what do we do? And I think the damage that's done by not doing it way out exceeds anything that um, not being able to spend the money on a few other projects uh, gain for us. So while I'm not 
overly happy spending nine million dollars i also understand that but that the the all is at the end of the life the original contractor that built the mall and laid the pavers the granite pavers laid them wrong the under base was incorrect rtd sued and collected money and they were using a lot of that money from the settlement of that suit to run a constant repair to the pavers now that money may have run out i don't know but the thing is the pavers don't break. What they do is the subsurface is what's given away. So maybe, and I don't know if they're planning on using any of the granite that's already in place in the new uh, mall development, but it's the underbase that makes the current one so hard to maintain. So I think they're trying to solve a very, very important regional problem by rehabbing that mall and making it fully functional and usable for another 40 years. So I will support that. As to the second part on the wait list, I'm open to that going either way um, because I would like to see if there is any leftover money and I'm not anticipating that so I think it might be a moot question. but. I think that some of the really big projects that are at the top of the wait list um, may have to be or should be con reconsidered, but I don't demand that. So I just wanted my ideas and my remembrances. Mr. Thank Starker. You. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'd like to get some uh, some further clarity on the relationship between the uh, Dr. Cog weighted score and the tier system. Uh, it, they seem to have a relationship. So this was an activity by the panel to develop the Tier 1 and Tier 2. Um, and I'll actually go back to what was included within the memo. Um, so <clears throat> I think one of the one of the tasks that the panel really had a little bit difficulty with was trying to figure out if a uh, the same project between a study pre-construction project and a construction project if they all had the same score how could they look at these projects in different lights um, in the past in our, in our application process you were comparing a bike project against another bike project but in this system we're not simply doing that so the way that these tiers were developed uh, according to the panel is they they took the um, I think they took the they for the tier two they took the bottom pre-construction project and they worked themselves up in score order on the construction projects to to hit their two tier two number um, they left all of the the four studies that were out there in tier one feeling that they had they were again us a lower amount of funding request but had uh, a slightly higher kind of future benefit to leave them in tier one somebody from the panel if i didn't sum that up correctly let me know but that didn't translate then into a necessarily a higher weighted average score no because the weights were applied beforehand within the score so for example um, the score that was received within, say, Section A, the subregional significance of the proposed project, that received a weighted score of 40. Um, the next section was 30 and so on. Those scores with the weight were all computed way before the panel received the information and decided to tier them into Tier 1 and Tier 2. And, and then so that if you've got a score that has the same weighted average, and a score that has the same tier, why does the more expensive project score higher than the less expensive project, specifically 8 and 9 and 10 and 11? So the, the funding request was not a part of the consideration. It really had to do with what that score was and where it fell within the ranking of all the construction projects, the pre-construction projects, or the studies. So between, would there then be a difference between eight and nine on the waiting list in the 
on the second in the second group. Sorry, good evening. Ron Papstorff, Transportation Planning Director for Dr. Cog. So in the cases of tied scores, when the panel was going through after, so the panel arrived at their recommendation on what projects to fund first, and then went through and made a recommendation on the order of the waiting list uh, for the remaining projects that weren't recommended for funding by the review panel. And in those cases, for those projects that had a tied score, they went to the regional significance score first. And so the project that scored higher in regional significance score, that 40% of the score, got kind of got prioritized on the waiting list over a project that scored the same that had a lower score in the regional significance share. Thank you. And then a, a question for the chair. Does the motion relate only to the, to the top eight projects, or does the motion relate also to the waiting list of the projects down below? Only to the top eight. So there's no. Or funding. Because all the ones right now are being recommended for funding are the top eight. But the motion includes the waiting list so that you're also approving those projects. So then I would like to, I would like to sort of forward Mr. Strzok's position that the, that the first two projects, which do eat up about $31 million, uh, be stricken from the waiting list of the projects. Thank you. Yeah, you'd have to make that as an amendment to the motion, but and you'd have to get a second, and you'd have to also get an approval of the motion maker to amend the motion. Mm -hmm. Right. So, Just to clarify, I wouldn't consider that a friendly amendment. I, I, I would be either a substitute or an amendment to the motion, and we would need to take a separate vote on that if you want to make that motion. Yeah, we'd have to make a motion to amend them. We would have to make an a motion to amend the original motion with the revision to the second tier of projects. I think that's what you were talking about. Yeah, to the waiting list. To the waiting list. But it would not affect the top eight. Those would still be in place the way you the way you have versed it. But you would need yours, and again, you would have to get the uh, acceptance of both the motion maker and the second to do those. So sit. Sit tight for a minute. I want to make sure I'm not screwing up the parliament team. Yes. So, All right, so I'm screwing it up. <laughs> Bob, hang on a second. Bob. So uh, this, you can do a substitute motion, which takes precedence over the original motion, and the substitute motion is voted on first. So an amendment is different. You do have to have a, a friendly amendment that the motion maker accepts. But a substitute motion is, is taken first. So the other thing, if I could, I would like to just make, this is a little bit off topic of what everybody else has been talking about, but I just wanted to, um, nobody's been bashing staff. As a matter of fact, people have been very complimentary of staff, but I want to defend staff a little bit and, and remind the board, staff did not want to be in the position that we're putting them in. <laughs> staff specifically said, we do not want to be the people that rank these projects. We do not want to be put in the position of spending a lot of our time and energy putting this list together just to have it torpedoed. So I, I'm not making a statement for or against at all. I'm just saying that um, you know Doug Rex and his staff have done a great job of putting this together, and uh, what he was concerned might happen 18 months ago is happening. <laughs> All right, let me finish. I've got, before we go too far with this, but are you recommending a substitute motion? No, I'm not. I'm not recommending a motion at all. Okay. Just, just a right. point of information. All right, so I still have people who have not talked. I still have people who want to come with a second round. I want to get through the first people first. Those who haven't had a chance, then I'm still coming back. I have at least two people who want to come a second time. And I have at least two more, I think, that have not had a chance to talk at all. Mr. Teeter, I'm coming to you. Thank you, Chair. First of all, I want to thank Adams County for allowing Commerce City to select the two projects that we brought forward. Adams County understands the importance of moving traffic east and west to the region. The two projects that we submitted was I-270 
and Highway 85, 120th flyover. Uh, 270 to start with is already a parking lot morning, noon, and night. It's already maxed out, let alone waiting another two to six years to do something with that. And also I-25, I mean 184, Highway 85 and 120 at the flyover, it needs to be just like it is down on Santa Fe Drive. There's two railroads that run through Commerce City. They parallel each other, the Santa Fe and the Burlington Northern. And that railroad brings in cars every day that start and stop, delivering rail cars and removing rail cars. If you are traveling east and west through Commerce City, it's, it's common all the time to be stopped 30 to 45 minutes while these trains transfer cars in and out. So it's very important that um, we move forward with this in the future. You know, we do meet the criteria on three different things. We have uh, the population of 56,000 people now, and we have just under 50 trucking companies in Commerce City. We move a lot of freight through Commerce City. And the, um, and the um, so it's very important that you know, we, we look at this. It's kind of like the chicken and the egg thing. You know, we need to start somewhere, um, whether it's just uh, looking at the region and doing the studies on it or moving forward with the projects. Thank you. Mr. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Arapahoe County would support the um, motion if the amendment, amendments to the waiting list are accepted. Um, have three communities that submitted projects um, that are communities in Arapahoe County, and I would do anything to see them have a better chance of having <laughs> some of the leftovers, so to speak, um, not Thanksgiving, but <clears throat> leftovers that may flow down to them in that, um, that tier. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Dyack. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm, I'm kind of sensing that from a majority standpoint that it seems like we're kind of, some people are okay with the, with the overall selection of the eight. Others want changes, but for most part, it seems like the focus is sort of on this wait list. So, uh, you know, based on what staff has indicated is that if there's $2 million, it's offered to number one, and they have to do the entire scope. So, you know, to me, the probability of getting $2 million uh, and completing a, you know, $10.3 million ask or a $20 million ask, pretty small. But, you know, I guess my question to staff is, in the past, how much additional monies have we gotten in a tip cycle? And what is the frequency? I mean, you know, to me, do we get them in, in certain tranches along? I mean, at the end, all of a sudden we have a two million dollars because a project was complete. I think that would maybe help us understand what I, what we're trying to get to. The most common is that a, a, a sm relative smaller project or projects cancel or close out and so that typically builds up a small amount at a time. There are occasions when larger projects close out or be are canceled, so they're all of a sudden might be four or five million dollars available. Um, there are occasions where see that will make us aware of five or six million dollars that we just happen to receive from Washington and on our, we're unaware of. Um, so that does happen. Um, not very often, you know, going back to 2009 with ERA, you know, we received almost sixty million dollars. So you never know, um, but I think one thing I would point out with this upcoming policy is whatever funding we receive through the door, it will be split 20% to regional, 80% to sub-regional, because each of the sub-regional forums will also have a waiting list. So, you know, for example, if there is $10 million that comes in, only $2 million will come to, the, to this waiting list for the regional call, 
8 million will go to the subregions, but then be split out according to your subregional percentage. So, you know, this is, again, this is a new process, and we don't know how this will end up. Um, so I, it, I'll kind of just leave it right there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Joel and Clark, I'm the alternate for City and County of Denver, um, and I'm relatively new to this room, uh, especially as an alternate. I don't get too many opportunities to be here. So thank you. Thank you for the thoughtful discussion. Um, while I'm new to this, I was born and raised in Denver. I've lived in Lakewood and Jefferson County and Arapahoe County, um, born in, in Denver. Um, and now I represent the folks at I-25 in Alameda that you spoke of earlier, Director. Um, and uh, for me, Denver has always been the region. It, it has always been bigger than the city and county of Denver, right? Those of us in this room who pay extra close attention to where imaginary lines are drawn on a map to a micro scale pay a lot of attention to that. But to everyone else, this is Denver. And one of the things that I consistently hear when other people come to visit the region and, and come through Denver or when I visit other areas is how impressed they are at how well we work together and how well we function as a region. And I know sometimes when we sit in this room, it doesn't feel like that. Um, but that is compared to other regions, we have traditionally done a lot better than that. Um, I, I do take issue with a couple of the things that have been said tonight and presented tonight. And I, I feel like um, while I'm new at this, I feel like we are close to losing that, that whatever other places have looked at us for leadership on we're we're maybe not there anymore we you know when when uh director you brought up that the biggest share no the biggest share now goes to sub-regionalism not regionalism this is the smallest amount of money that has ever been committed by this board to regionalism 80 percent 80 percent is sub-regional so this might be the biggest piece of that but that's a very small piece where we are looking regionally this is the number one ridership route 16th street mall and i know that there are issues with pavement trust me we have had those conversations in denver and it is a historic asset we're up against some things we are trying to make something that connects to almost every single train line that this city has connects to that bus route it is the number one ridership bus route in rtd's region it connects to the state capitol, where people from all over the state come for government and come to speak to their government. If this is not a regional project, and, and uh, you know, again, I, I love this city, and when I say this city, I mean this region. But to hear someone say, uh, you know, I live in Castle Pines and I can't go back to my constituents, there are a lot of things on here that if we're going to balkanize, and I'm going to say my constituents aren't going to use, and I can list a lot of these things that my constituents are never going to use. 38 years I've lived in this region, I maybe never set foot in Castle Pines. doesn't mean that a project coming forward from Castle Pines is something that I'm going to pick on. I haven't heard anybody from Denver picking on any other projects, but I have heard put forward today, take Denver's one project that got funded off the list, and then on the wait list, let's take off those next two Denver projects as well. It starts to feel a lot like we are picking on Denver, and I don't know the history of why people are upset or why people are picking on Denver, but this should be about regionalism. We should be setting the tone for a country that is increasingly more and more divided we have an opportunity to do that. I believe we lost a little bit of that and how we've already separated the money and 80% of that money is going to be decided to be spent on smaller projects in sub-regions. This is the 20%. If we can't come out of this and say the, the RTC and the RTA and all these things that I don't even know what they mean yet have all put forward this recommendation and I look at this list through my Denver lens and I see that two projects in my district, not just in Denver, in the district of 55,000 people I personally represent rated higher and were ranked lower than other projects. And to hear everyone say, take all of Denver stuff off the list effectively, then we're not a regional body anymore. I don't know what we're doing here. If we're gonna take 80% and put it away, and then we're gonna pick on this, and we're gonna vote this down tonight, despite all of the recommendations that have come forward. So I hope for the heart and soul of the city that I have was born and raised in and that I love and I happen to represent, apparently the guy that everybody is mad at in the room, not everybody, there are a lot of great people who said good things too, um, <laughs> but that has been picked on tonight. I hope that we can get past that and we can really continue to be 
that light that everyone else looks forward to and say, yeah, it's not perfect. And yeah, if we could have done it without granite, but this is a regional project and this is a regional list. And this is the 20% of our money that we spend on those things. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Daniel. Hello. I've heard so much I'm confused about what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm ready to vote. But let me point out, uh, I, I'm the last person who wants to be divisive. It, we, and I believe strongly in regionalism. I'm really troubled. Um, if, you, if this is 20% and everybody's getting 80%, so is your region. Everybody's region is treated the same. And there we have our neighbors. Some of us have, sorry, David. Uh, some of us have more than one body to deal with, all of us but two. And that's OK. <coughs> we'll get along fine. My concern, when I hear all of this unpreparedness we had little Federal Heights got one project, thank you very much. And it is uh, virtually all completed. Some has to be redone. But in order to get little bits of property rights, just for example, just a little bit of land so that things could flow smoothly on that intersection, that some of it still has to go to court. Uh, th there was there was nothing reasonable about it, getting it complete. So, if there's a little known to be done yet, a little is going to take a long time, and I think that uncertainty creates a lot of anxiety. And when I look at, and I am not one who is against our wonderful city. Um, when I look at five projects in five communities and tell me if you ever drive to 70 when in the hell does it work right almost i haven't gone at midnight or two in the morning i've gone late at night but i don't think it ever works well i can't imagine that one not making the list but then i'm not criticizing the scores and i'm sorry dr rex I'm really very sorry, because your, your people are good people. They did what we asked them. There are some things we didn't understand, and this system works a lot better than in the past. But I don't think I would win an election if, if I uh, supported the top eight projects unmodified. Thank you for the opportunity to suggest that you think about some changes, and I hope they're positive. And at the end of the day, I love you all. Thank you. <laughs> all right, before I start round two, is there anyone who has not had an opportunity to express an opinion or thoughts or questions? Mr. Deal? <laughs> Why not? Why, Why not? <laughs> the Air Force let me go. I was in Washington, D.C. It isn't working? No. Oh, I guess I had it on all along. <laughs> when the Air Force let me go when I was in Washington, D.C., I knew congestion. And uh, since we weren't uh, big enough to vote for uh, improving our roadways, then I don't think pain's big enough. So if you go back to your constituents and they're complaining about congestion, you have to have more pain, folks, and then maybe they'll change it. Maybe they'll give some more uh, funding to, uh, <laughs> to roads. But we, we have to figure out a way if we're going to improve the roads to getting places. Uh, I've used the, the 16th Street mall bus a lot of times, and I don't even use the metro as much as I sh could or should. I think that we should get this done and support it. Uh, I've been involved in historical preservation before. I understand the nuances of it, and as a council member, I shake my head sometimes. but need to remember just like we respected our capital and did some things there 
to do it right and to maintain it. So I'll be voting for the top eight, and I feel good about them, and I'll listen thoughtfully as we get suggestions on whether or not to modify things below. But I really respect staff. As a guy who spent 30 years in the Air Force, if I didn't have staff, I'd just drop dead. Same way when I worked for Jefferson County. So this, <laughs> this show it, this, this show the respect that we gave to them and give them this hot potato. And I strongly remember the vote on 80-20 also. And I come from a small community, if you think Golden is. And you'll hear about it on the 19th of December, I guess. Thank you very much, <laughs> Mr. Chair. <laughs> All right, it, last call for anyone who has not had an opportunity. All right, I'm going to go back to Mr. Partridge first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, I think if we uh, just look in a crystal ball, regardless of whatever happens tonight, I think with this project, Denver's going to have streets that are granite. I think that's probably a given when you really look at it because it, it most likely that's going to occur. It's just a comment to make just in, in understanding where Denver sits and where this 16th Street project really is. I find it interesting, though, that we have a, a project that scores as it does, but then there's an offer to split it, but that scoring stays the same and it gets down put on a waiting list there, number one. So it's kind of interesting. And then you, you just look at the second project down there on the waiting list. Talk about a regional project that certainly is that number two projects that's, that's definitely a region i think what we really uh, can come out of this tonight with i truly believe a lot of the comments regarding changing the criteria is not the right thing to do but i think we have lessons learned from this tonight that yeah we need to pay attention to pavement condition index we need to pay attention to the type of pavement that's going to be uh, on a reconstruction project or all projects. I think we, but uh, I, and staff, I may be tough on questions, but when it comes to compliments, I'll give you the best. And Mr. Art Griffith, one of my best friends and the, the true mentor for me, knows how tough some of my questions are. But when it comes into the day, I'll be the first guy to buy him a drink. So I really appreciate staff. You guys are wonderful. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's what I heard. <laughs> no, I'm just talking art. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Chair, with that, I would like to offer, offer a substitute motion. I will move that we approve the eight regional share projects as presented and of the ranked order waiting list to remove the top project from the waiting list but leave all others as is. Second. Okay, let me make sure I understand, uh, Roger. The top eight would be left in place, and the, six, the remainder of the 16th Street Mall project is what you're asking to be removed, and everything else on the wait list stays the same as it is, in the same rank order. Correct. Okay. And I heard a second, I think. Stock, you were the second? Okay. So, would anybody like to quit and go home? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, right now we have a substitute motion, and I have a second for that. Before we come back to the original motion, we need to vote for the substitute motion. Now, this is going to take a few minutes. I know you're all getting tired, but I'm not going to do this with a voice vote. Because I can't tell who's voting what. So you will have to put your little hands up and keep them up so we can see them. Yes, ma'am. I, I just have a question. I mean, sure. are you not allowing debate on this new motion? As soon as I get the motion on the table, I okay, will. Okay. I'm just trying to make sure we're going to go through the process correctly. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. Again, I'm not going to take a voice vote because I can't count the heads that are going up and down saying yes and actually not saying yes. So when we get to that, to the, get to the point of voting on the motion, we will do it by hand. And uh, there are three of us that count. And I hope this time we can all three count the same number. <laughs> so it took us a while the last time. All right, now for that motion, I have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on the substitute motion? 
Mr. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we've had a lot of discussion here today. I think Director Clark um, made a lot of excellent points on here, uh, as well as kind of echo, go back to what Director Stolzman said earlier. Uh, when, when we prepared our projects for this process, we, we really tried to look, what are the criteria Dr. Cog is looking at? What are the criteria the board has agreed on that uh, is important for a regional project? We put together three very good projects, uh, two of which scored very highly, as you can see in the, in the scoring based on that. Um, uh, based purely on scoring would have been funded on that. You heard concerns about this, about how, how funding is being allocated, um, uh, came back, cut one project more than fit by more than 50 percent, uh, and had the other project, the Broadway project, moved down uh, into the wait list on that. I um, just want to stress, this is not simply a simple repaving in granite of the 16th Street Mall as an aspect of it, but there's also uh, pretty substantial redesign aspects that will improve safety, that will improve capacity and its ability to move folks from these regional hubs to throughout the city and to wherever they need to go. I, I, I just really feel we, we did our best to follow the process and to now just remove one half of that project, I think is a mistake. Thank you. Other comments on the substitute motion, Ms. Henry? It's, it's called compromise. Sometimes we have to compromise. Sometimes we don't get everything that we want. It's what regionalism is all about. Other comments or questions? Mr. Pfeiffer? I think my frustration, I mean, I agree, staff did a great job. I think my frustration is all the regions try to put together a compromise of a project or a dollar amount. What I think disturbs me more than anything is Denver's three projects far exceeded what we were asking. So I mean, I think that's where I struggle with this more than anything is you asked for 20 million, 20 million, 15 million. That's a lot. And I know I'm in two subregions and we were self-aware that we shouldn't ask for 20, 30, 40, 100 million. In fact, I think Adams County knows how many times I complained about the $200 million project they were going after. But the point was, we were considerate to know that the peanut butter had to be spread in some form or another. And I think I struggle. I, I don't disagree with the scoring. I don't disagree. I think we did all we can. I think it just bothered me that I know for a fact that Jefferson County and Adams County compromised. And when we submitted on that horse, and, said, and I always said this, let's bet on the horse that will win, because we knew we not all would win. So we all said, well, let's put in something that we get a little peanut butter for this thing. And that didn't happen. I think that's where the regionalism issue comes, is the peanut butter wasn't spread or put in consideration by Denver. And that's where I think I struggle with it. So I'll leave it there, and we'll see how the vote goes. Ms. Jones. I guess I just want to point out the reason we're struggling with this is because we didn't put very much money in the regional pot. And the goal of the regional pot wasn't so much to spread the peanut butter. That's what the sub-regional pots are, are not even supposed to be doing, but that's what they will do. The regional pot, even as small as it was, was to, to fund regionally significant projects. and. You know, I, I don't know that I want to penalize Denver for writing two really good project applications that scored high because I assume they were well written and because the projects were regionally significant and I trust staff that they were consistent in using the criteria we gave them. So I, I do feel like compromise was had by um, allowing the project to be spit, uh, to be split in the first place. And I guess I would also encourage us to recognize that the chances of very much money showing up on the wait list is pretty limited. So we're spending a lot of time arguing over something that's probably not that likely. Um, and with that, I guess I, I'm going to support my original motion. Other comments on the substitute motion? Got anything? OK. So. From my standpoint, this is a weighted thing. And we set the criteria as a board. 
And now I, I'm concerned we're sitting here at the board meeting at the final night and trying to change the criteria. <coughs> if I look at the point spread, I guess my question is, is how did the score of 2.3 for a $20 million project get down to the wait list when it scored ahead of the final two projects <coughs> on the approved list? If we, if we followed the criteria, that project should have been above the line. I understand there's not enough money, but from a scoring standpoint of meeting the criteria, regardless of the dollar figure, because as I understand the comments have been made, dollar figure was not a determining factor. It's how they scored based upon the application that was put in. That's two more projects above the line that should not be there. And Denver would have gotten the opportunity to ask if you want to fund partially two projects, not one. <coughs> So I, I think we have we have to make a decision. Are we going to put a criteria together and stick with it through the process? And if you want to change it after the process, then amend it. But we've got two different sets of staff that have looked at this. The Dr. Cog staff was one group, but a representative from every region and some experts that we had agreed to hire spent a hell of a lot of time on this. And now we're saying we don't like what you came up with, but we appointed you to the group to do it. What is the message that we're sending back to our own staff that work for us? I don't know how we're going to fix this, but it's, it's causing a lot of dissension sitting here tonight watching this back and forth because we've picked out one or two projects. <coughs> to me, the granite was never an issue. I heard very clearly that it's a requirement of the historical piece of that process, so I'm taking that off the table. The method of whether it's using asphalt, concrete, or granite doesn't weigh in on the technical part of this, not in my opinion. What it weighs in on it is what was put in the application that was reviewed and scored by those people we put in a position to do the scoring for us. I don't disagree with Larry that it got down to the point that we won't get a small project on a regional basis. But we better darn well look at those small projects when we get to the sub-regional area because that's the greatest opportunity. I recall back when we made this decision to do the 2080, I was not in favor of the 2080. I thought the 20 was too small to get any real regional piece out of the regional projects. But we made a decision as a board, regardless of whether I stood or anyone else stood, that was the decision of the board, it's 2080. That's what we're living with. So I guess what we are gonna have to do is figure out from a standpoint of which way do we wanna go? So you have a substitute motion, I'll get you just a second here. I get you, you've got a substitute motion. Depending on how that motion comes out, then we'll come back to the original motion. Ms. Henry. First, I want to say, Director Clark, welcome to the committee. This is the way the last two TIF processes actually have gone through. And we still eventually end up loving each other. So don't give up on regionalism, OK? Yeah, and, and, and I'll have coffee with you and we'll talk about it sometime. Um, what they say about me isn't always all bad. Um, the reason why we went to the sub-regional process, one of the reasons is the fact there were a lot of communities that were left out. At the last TIP process, now Adams County, every single highway goes through Adams County. Every single highway. 85, 270, I-70, I-25, 76, 36. They all, every single highway. And we got no money. Adams County got no money. And the lion's share went to two other counties. And Roger and I, you know, I'm, I'm a little on the left side, and Roger's a little on the right side, spent, yeah, maybe just a little spent three days on the Aurora water tour on a bus together. And it's amazing how people who are from two different political parties, extreme political parties, got together and had a conversation about how the process before this was so unfair. It was really unfair. And we ended up with the process that we have going on right now. And Adams County is doing really well. In fact, we have projects on the Highway 7 is we're actually partnering with Boulder, Broomfield, and Adams County, 
and all the municipalities in Adams County and Boulder are supporting. That kind, that's the kind of regionalism that is coming out of this process that two people here have been criticizing. And I have a problem with that when we haven't even completely, complete, completely finished it. So granted, the pot for the, regional, for the regional project isn't as big as it used to be, but there's a lot of regionalism that is going on with the sub-regional projects. And I think we need to be able to celebrate that with that process. So I take a lot, I, I, take, I take it to heart when people sit and criticize what's going on right now. Because one, this is a democracy and this is the way it works. And we are supposed to be able to question process. If we don't question process or how things were done, we're in trouble. We're in serious trouble. When this is all done, I'm going to talk about how I had issues with it not being transparent in the scoring. Um, and, and we'll be able to work those out in the next process. It's going to be exactly the same way. It doesn't matter which way we go. If we have a bigger regional pot or a smaller regional pot, we're still going to have those arguments. And three quarters of the people here won't be here. So you know, I, I really get tired of hearing about the criticism about how small this regional pot is, because there's a lot of regionalism that's going on in the subregions. Thank you. Other comments? Real quick, a question to staff. When the scoring about, you know, when we're going through this process, one of the things we were told that we should really focus on is exactly what Eva's saying, which is, you know, we were to work with our partner groups, our subregions, our, uh, you know, communities, and the more partners that came together, we would have got a heavier, better score. Um, how did that play into the scoring? Maybe you can explain that a little bit more. So. I'll actually. I don't think you're on. Turn the mic. Yeah. There we go. There you go. Happy face. Yes, it is. There, I pushed it twice. So there we go. Um, in the first section of the scoring criteria, the the subregional significance of the proposed project weighted 40 percent. Questions included: Does this proposed project cross and benefit multiple municipalities? Another question for subregions. Um, and another question for described funding and project partnerships. So having more partnerships, crossing more boundaries, showing that, showing that your project can provide more benefit to neighboring communities would in theory score you higher in the highest category um, with the highest weighting. So, so and, and, and who was the person to determine those partnerships were I mean, the way I look at it is, I think we went after letters and support, you know, letters of support and discussions amongst the regions and communities, and they all signed up, and you saw logos on here. But, you know, when we, when we talk about some of these others uh, that are here, are we, are we seeing that same regionalism? Like, you know, I was really impressed with Broomfield's submission, you know, where I think there was eight or nine logos up there that were on that, and that, that I thought was the intent, the, the, the spirit of the regional funds. I would agree that. Yeah, it doesn't like you. I would agree that that's the spirit, but I don't think in the scoring process, if you had eight or nine partnerships, you received the highest, when maybe you only had three or four, you scored the lowest. Now, yes, there is a comparison across um, all of the applications, but I, I, I think you would really only score low if you had zero or one. These buttons. Um, so I struggle with that because I asked that question several months ago about that, uh, that particular scoring process and was wanting to make sure that that partnership had a weight. And I brought it up in the sub-region meetings uh, right, with well, staff. Uh, here, I think I got to turn mine off. Yeah, I think it's. I think. The way I would look at this is that in the previous scoring system that we used to have, it was all based on if you had a certain number, you scored a certain number of points, and the system is not based on that. So, 
I think that was a consideration. If you had a high number of partnerships, that was, of course, considered, but I don't think that was the only way to look at things. It doesn't have to be based on a number or doesn't have to be based on a dollar amount. Mr. Mr. Chairman, if I may, um, Director Pfeiffer, yeah, I, you know, I, I distinctly remember the conversation about this, and I, it was probably at the technical review group who developed the criteria that presented that to you all. Um, I think originally when we looked at that, we, there was an emphasis we, uh, that was asked by the board that we put an emphasis on partnerships and that regional collaboration piece, right, that that should be part of the scoring. Um, I distinctly remember the scoring was changed so because, I mean, you can't prejudice a project just because it's within, you know, like we have two subregions, there are no other jurisdictions, right? So you can't, you can't have, so the criteria was changed to an extent that it, it had what, what value or benefit would it provide to other subregions as well, not just the number of communities that were involved in that pro project. Tim Buttons. Happy um, face. The happy face. The, okay, so I get that because we in, in Adams County had a discussion around the Commerce City submittal on 270, and I believe Denver even signed up in support of that. And, and it, it's, I think the intent, the spirit, again, was not necessarily direct. It's who, what partners or communities believed it impacted their constituency didn't have to reside there didn't but I just want to make sure that that we didn't lose that because that was I felt that that was very important to me at one point in, in this process that collaboration and partnerships were the values we were looking for in this this process so I'll leave it there but I just I, get, I felt like we might have fell a little short maybe or maybe we misunderstood it and and I don't know I, don't think we did. I just first of all I want to say we take take no issue with the scoring. It was, it was an intentional process that we had 12 Dr. Cox staff do the technical scoring to try to mitigate different ways that different people would look at all of these various applications. Um, second of all, I'd say welcome to the TIP process. This, is, this might be my first TIP process at Dr. Cog, but it is by far not my first TIP process. And you, believe me, this is no different than what other MPOs and other regions go through every TIP cycle. So condolences, welcome to the club. Don't beat yourselves up too much. Um, regional significance was weighted 40% out of the total score. Regional significance in the criteria in the application consisted of seven, seven different considerations that the staff looked at in looking at the applications to get those criteria and against those questions. And projects scored higher or lower within each of those seven. One of those seven was funding and or um, project partnerships. So that was one consideration as part of regional significance, but it wasn't the only consideration when assessing regional significance across the projects. All right, sorry, I'm hogging up the, I'm trying to get to a comfortable place for me. Um, so in the Denver scenario, let's just walk through that one since that's the one that's a lightning rod right now. Um, it is, was part of that discussion about regionalism, is it the contribution they brought? Because it is 118 million, I think is what I heard, and they're funding roughly 100 million-ish it, uh, uh, 98 million. I mean, you know, because we had a minimum contribution that was added. So they brought partners, money, and everything else. How did that weigh into the scoring? I think that gets into probably Eva, uh, Eva's question about the scoring and the transparency around the scoring. I think we need more detail around that. So leverage was weighted. So like lever leverage was weighted 10%. So that was a separate criteria. So there was weighting around leverage. Within, I, look, I can't speak for all 12 Dr. Cox staff that scored. And first of all, no problem with, with the questions about scoring. But keep in mind, it was very intentional at the board that the technical scoring was not the be all and end all of the process. Um, that the review panel and the technical advisory committee and the regional transportation committee really had an opportunity to look at that in consideration of the overall objectives of that regional share pot of funds. Um, but the, the different funding sources coming into projects, I think for me, as I reviewed projects, did 
did kind of impact how I scored on the funding and or project partnerships as in, in that component of, of regional criteria. And I'm sure other folks that looked at the project applications looked at that one way or the other. Okay, final comments on the substitute motion. And just a reminder, the substitute motion is to approve the top eight projects as presented and to take the number one project on the second list and remove it from the list and move everything else up. That is the genesis of the motion. Okay. All those in favor of the substitute motion, please raise your hand. in opposition to the board. Five, six, All right. So the substitute motion carries on a vote of 20 to 12. We don't need the other one. Yeah. OK. So the way the thing is going forward at this point, is that the again the top eight projects will move forward as recommended project number one of the substitute list will be moved removed from the list and all projects below the number one will move up one slot <coughs> yes sir sorry just one um, notice for those of you on the board that are on the regional transportation committee we'll have a conversation about um, potentially reconvening that we had planned on canceling the regional transportation committee meeting in December um, with a different decision coming from the board uh, that's the process we'll have to we'll con we'll have to talk about re reconvening the regional transportation committee to have a meeting probably in December to reconsider um, the board's different decision um, and ask the Regional Transportation Commission to reconsider their decision um, to come into alignment with the board's decision tonight. That so. means this is going to come back to us too. So, so just so everybody understands that, I know that was those who have been around a while probably understood it, but in order for any transportation-related action to pass, um, we have to have the same affirmative action by the RTC and the board. If there's a change in that, that action, then it has to go back to the other body. So, uh, so in this case, we will take back the waiting list recommendation. And, uh, and, and, uh, you know, and, a, and if they agree with that, then it will not come back. But if they don't agree with that, then it will come back. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. So and I, I think it's important to keep that in mind that uh, it's regardless of what the vote was just now, it still has a chance to come back to you in the month of December if we can get an RTC re-engaged by them. Ms. Francone, you had a question. I was probably not paying attention, but did you say what the date of that RTC meeting was? Well, we didn't have one scheduled. We had, uh, we we're going to have to get one put back in place now. Yeah. yeah, we had tentatively planned one for the 18th, but uh, they don't know what the decision was tonight that they'll have to be working on. Ms. Smith? Um, so can you describe, does this affect the schedule in terms of the sub-area or the sub-regional if, if RTC does not agree and it has to come back here again? It does. Oh, I, I. God. I'll speak. Um, it does not. We don't anticipate opening up the call for subregion until January. Okay, somewhere in here we have got another. Okay. So we have one informational piece in here, uh, Ms. Dragan. <coughs> Somebody who's been around here all night now finally gets a chance to talk. 
And for the committee reports, uh, if you are here for the committee reports, let's try to keep those as distinct as we can. Thanks for sticking around, Celeste. Okay. Hi, good evening. My name is Celeste Davis-Dragan, and I'm the Way to Go Program Manager, and I want to talk to you about some good news. We just finished our GoTober campaign. So just to give you some highlights of that, our challenge details, who played in the game, uh, our winners, and some of the goals and results that were associated. So just as a mild refresh, Way to Go is a partnership, a regional partnership between Dr. Cog and seven different transportation management associations throughout the region. We work together in alignment with Metro Vision goals to reduce traffic congestion and improve air quality. And we also just make life better. We do all of these things through promoting transit, biking, walking, carpooling, van pooling, and telework. Our challenge was um, derived about four years ago. And what we have found through experience and research is that when people find new commute options that are supported by their employer, they tend to be lasting. So our challenge runs through October, the month of, and we encourage people to take as many positive, smart commute trips that they can during that month. And by doing this, they win honor, prize, glory. They actually get an ad in the Denver Business Journal, and um, they also have incentives and weekly prizes, as well as a grand prize for the employees. And what we found is that employers are really excited because it allows them in this really tight economy to retain and attract the best talent because they're providing their employees with these really good transportation incentives. And so the challenge itself, what we try to do is we encourage people to take eight smart commit, commute trips during the month. Basically that is one trip, one round trip per week. And what we found is that through research and through our experience, once you do that, once a week for a month, it kind of sticks. And you're like, hey, this really wasn't that bad. It's totally chill. I can ride the bus and I can get all this work done. Check my emails out. Um, and so we use our platform, My Way to Go, for people to track their trips and then people can win prizes. So who participated in this? We had 58 companies participate this year and we reached nearly 60,000 employees in the region. And some of the folks that we just kind of decided to show you just showcase some of the variety in our market sectors as well as throughout the region. We had Western Union this year for the first time as well as Amazon, which we were really excited. They had some great participation. And then we had some our previous winner, Imagine, as well as NREL participate again. Some of these are familiar names, Google, Davida. But more importantly, I know you care about this the most, who from Dr. Cog board participated? <laughs> right. We saw a lot of participation this year. And if your name isn't here, Golden, Arvada, um, who else? We want you next year. We will totally talk to you guys and get you on board and give all your, commute, your employees a chance to commute differently and have fun doing it. Um, the results of this program actually, each of the employers, we go back to them and we give them a mode split. And we say, hey, look, this is how people are commuting to and from your office. Now let's talk about a TDM plan and how we can continue this behavior and what are some opportunities for us to maximize this. So for example, at Dr. Cog, centrally located, near a bunch of transit, we had 71% of our employees using transit. Plus we have an eco pass. That's great news. We're using it. So how can we capitalize on that and kind of move forward with that? But I know you really want to know who won. So our winners this year were Rocky Mountain Institute, which is a research and development organization in Boulder, Xilinx, which is a Longmont technological company that does programmable logic devices. I'm not really sure what that means. Um, and then we had SparkFun, which is an electronics retailer in Niwot. And then we had Gusto, who was a first time participant, and they knocked it out of the park. They're actually here in downtown, and they provide human resources and cloud-based um, payroll services. So we were really excited to see a newbie, as well as some of the repeat contenders perform really well in the program. And how did we perform against our goals? Well, our goal was 50 companies. We got 58. Bam. Our goal was 40,000 non-SOV Vehicle trips logged, we beat that by more than 40%, and we had 58,882 trips that were logged, which is pretty exciting. 
We had 1,899 qualified participants out of the 2,280 participants. So what that means is more than 80% of the people participating tracked those eight trips, which is exciting because that means they probably changed their behavior. And that will will then survey everybody post-event just to understand what that lasting behavior effect is in the region, which is pretty, I mean, it's pretty exciting to see the um, impacts of this program. And we had over 3,420 new registrations on our My Way to Go platform, which is a proprietary system that allows you to track your trips as well as find ride matching services. We went around the planet 27 times. We had over 669,000 miles that were tracked in this campaign, and we were able to offset 186.3 tons of CO2, which is pretty exciting. And we burned over three and a half million calories. So go ahead, don't feel bad about that extra serving in Thanksgiving, we burned the calories for you. And in the process, we also had a lot of fun. So what we found is having a fun and supportive environment really opens that trial period for people because they can look back and see their employees and it kind of creates it like hey man i totally rode the bus today it's great oh you know someone nice <laughs> all right well that's good yeah so you can see all the different people that took uh different modes and they were having fun doing it and we encourage all of you to participate again next year if you have any questions my information is in the board packet or you can reach out to steve erickson who's our director of communications and marketing but we encourage you to take part if you can so thank you thanks the list good job all right committee reports miss jones stack shockingly the biggest discussion at the last stack meeting was over distribution of funding, um, specifically the regional priority program funds, which are super flexible funds, so everybody wants them. It's a perennial fight with the rural parts of the state thinking that the evil metro area is taking too much money. Um, Ron and I gave it the, the best fight we could, we lost, um, and the funding that the uh, the option that was put forward as a recommendation of the Transportation Commission further decreases Dr. Cog's share of the funding. However, ultimately it's up to the Transportation Commission to decide. They won't do so till the first part of the next year. Last year they didn't, or last go around, they didn't listen to the stack, so we can hope that perhaps they won't again as well. At least we'll be working to convince them that way. Um, we also heard some other updates, but I'll let it go at that. Ms. Smith, go ahead. I could add uh, one thing to that. That was the stack report out. Staff still at this point in time does not have a recommendation, and they will also make a recommendation to commission. Okay. Uh, Metro Mayor is probably the most important thing that we've done in the last couple of weeks is we actually uh, had a sit down on transportation with the governor-elect and his uh, staff member. They are convening a summit on December the 17th. Uh, they are starting to develop an invite list. I don't know where that's at. It's their list. But they will be talking about primarily two subjects, the funding for education and the funding for transportation. Uh, those are two big pieces. One thing that we did get a confirmation on out of the governor-elect is that he will not support any transportation bill that doesn't come with a revenue stream. That is doesn't come with a, a revenue stream, a way to pay for it. Uh, that's pretty well where he was at during his campaign. He hasn't changed that stance. Uh, all I can tell you is that stand by, there's more to come. Uh, please give Flo your blessing tonight before you leave. I think she told me today that they have... And Eva, yeah, even... And Elise. And are something like 80 resumes they have to review by Friday or the new CDOT director. So we know where they'll be for the next couple of days anyway. Mr. Partridge, he left, OK? At least you've got the county commissioners. OK. <laughs> Those who leave will chastise them next time. Ms. Warren, are you still around? OK. Okay, moving on. Mr. Rex, Rack. Thanks, sir. Uh, 
the meeting was really eaten up with two, two, uh, two topics, uh, work program and budget, and uh, we had a very good discussion on the, uh, on the proposed rulemaking, the low, low emission vehicle, and uh, ultimately the, uh, the board decided to send a letter of support of that rulemaking. Ron's not here. Did anybody else cover E470? Yeah. Uh, I got it. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, we, we talked about, actually we acted and approved uh, partnering with Arapahoe County on uh, some land so they can build out their, their interchange at, at Quincy. So that was, that was the big highlight. Mr. Van Meter, how about a wrap up? The RTD board did not have a fast tracks committee meeting last month. They will on a, um, next Tuesday, nothing to report. Boys and girls, we're done for the night. Everybody drive safely and be careful going home. Okay. See you. Take care. No, I, I'm getting nervous. If you, have, if you need a parking spotlight. validation, please see Connie. <laughs> it's after 10. He's talked enough. Reports get shorter the later in the morning. Yes, exactly. He's trying to run it with I don't know. All I know is that I heard it was bad before. Oh, it's it's sausage again. No, that's the way That's the truth. But I heard that we have a long way to go. I don't. I tell you what. You get over seven people. Oh, it, it, it's great. The committee over seven people.